Nancy Drew and the Secret of Mermaid Cove Chapter 1 Nancy and Bess felt excited as they stepped off the airplane. They had been riding on an eight-hour flight from River Heights to England. Man my legs are so stiff. Remind me never to travel by air, again. Bess complained while she tried to stretch out her limbs. Yeah, next time we are going to travel the world cruise ship. I just hope you are not prone to sickness. Nancy added as Bess nodded in agreement. It was extremely nice of Aunt Betty to pay for us a real vacation, Nancy commented while they walked up to the baggage claim area. She could see her blue polka-dotted bag coming down the conveyor belt. Aunt Betty was so grateful to us for finding the long-lost ruby necklace that she insisted on sending us on a spring break vacation. It is just too bad George had to stay behind for that marathon. Bess replied before sitting down and opening her large teal duffel bag. She pulled out a small, gold compact mirror and checked her makeup and hair. All she needed was just a little more shimming lip gloss to complete her sultry look. Keep in mind that George has been looking forward to that marathon for close to a year. I hear that her rival, Deirdre Shannon will be there. I am sure George will easily win and raise a lot of money for the local animal shelter. Bess said while grabbing another matching teal suitcase from the baggage claim, leaving only her large spinner suitcase to be located. Bess spotted the last piece of their luggage and tried to grab it but a young woman blocked her way. Bess sidestepped past the women before chasing after the spinner as to move along the conveyor belt. The girl stretched to grab the piece of luggage but could not reach it. Just then, a strange hand reached out and grabbed a hold of it. Pardon me but I believe this is yours, said a handsome young man. Carter it is you. I can't believe it. Wow, you just as cute as ever. Bess exclaimed as she pulled him into a gentle embrace. Carter held Bess in his arms and gently lifted her up onto her tiptoes. He had a slightly athletic build with deep green eyes and dark, blonde, wavy, hair. Carter a relative of Ned Nickerson, was athletic, well-mannered, and intelligent. He had first met Bess a couple of months ago when the sleuthing teens were trying to solve the mystery of the ghost maiden and had been smitten on each other ever since. Watching from the sidelines, made Nancy feel a little jealous. She knew Bess's heart had been broken so much in the past. Hopefully, now she had found someone wonderful to spend time with. I am so happy to see you but why are you here? Bess asked as they parted from the warm embrace. I spent all my savings and wanted to surprise you, he explained. Then he looked to Nancy, Ned had wanted to come with me but had to stay behind. He sends his love. Nancy looked down at her feet and sighed. She was feeling depressed from being so far away from home. She also hated the feeling of being the third wheel in this three-person group. Nancy wondered if she ever made her friends feel excluded when she was with Ned Nickerson. It turned out that Carter had planned this whole thing out with Bess's mother in secret. He was also going to stay in the same small inn as the girls. He had done his research on the area and knew of many fun actives and interesting places to travel while here. The taxi ride felt awkward to Nancy because all the love birds did was flirt with each other. To combat her boredom, Nancy just took out her little old camera to pictures of the lovely passing scenery. Two hours later, they arrived at a small old townhouse near a beautiful park. Nancy had noticed lots of metal and stone statues of different figures scattered throughout the park as they drove by. After paying the taxi driver, Carter carried the luggage in for the girls. Once inside, they were greeted by the smell of freshly baked bread. Bess's stomach growled with hunger, reminding her that she had not eaten for hours. The house was decorated in a shabby chic, meat beachy style with lots of colored bottles, starfish, seashells, and candles. A kind couple, in their mid-thirties, came out from the kitchen to meet them at the front door. Their names were Mark and Pearl Green. They explained that Pearl ran this inn while Mark owned and operated a whale-watching service. 
Pearl happily led the girls upstairs to their bedroom. There was no closet, instead, it has an amour with built-in drawers made into the front of it. There were two twin-size beds, a small writing desk, and a large cedar chest. The room might be simplistic but once Nancy went over to pull back the cherry-colored curtain to find that the view from the window was amazing. It looked out over the park, which had many flowering plants and trees. She could even see a little bit of the blue ocean behind the other buildings. Later, when they had finished unpacking, the girls decided to change in something more suitable for the beach. Nancy chose a pair of white high-waisted shorts with a teal loose-fitting tank top. With this, she wore some cat-eye-shaped sunglasses with small pearl stud earrings. Bess, on the other hand, took much longer to pick something out. Trying to impress Carter, she chose a knee-length, white lace, sundress, and some matching heels. To keep things simple, she wore a gold locket necklace from her grandmother. Chapter 2 Nancy, Bess, and Carter walked along the boardwalk taking in the many sights and sounds. Small shopping stands that sold everything from beach-themed teas to fishing bait littered the landscape around them. As they passed a particularly run-down-looking stall a brightly colored shell necklace caught Bess's eye. You have a good eye that is a sunset shell necklace. It's very rare to find in these parts of the world. And let me just say that it would look amazing on you, said a flirtatious young male clerk with a sly smile. Out of the corner of her eye, Nancy noticed Carter tense up as the scene unfolded in front of them. Bess blushed slightly before asking, it looks very exotic. Where is it from? Hawaii, or at least that is what I was told. Would you like to try it on? asked the shopkeeper as he lifted up the necklace from the display. Sure, why not? Bess replied with eyes shining with delight. Unexpectedly, as the merchant held out the necklace for her to hold, Carter stepped forward and took the item into his own hands. Carter gently lifted Bess's hair as he clasped the delicate necklace in place. Then he pulled out his wallet and bought the necklace for her. In response, Bess kissed him on the cheek gently. Carter threw the shopkeeper a dirty look before walking off with Bess's hand in his. Nancy grinned, she had found Carter's reaction to the flirtatious shopkeeper very entertaining. As they looked around Nancy noticed a lot of cute guys. She had a boyfriend back home but still enjoyed running into a cute face every now and then. As they walked deeper into the crowd, Nancy lost sight of her friends. As she walked along the path, it reminded her of driving a car on the interstate. Every time she would try to stop and browse someone would run into her. After almost an hour of this, she felt very frustrated and was ready to leave. She decided to take a short break before looking for her friends again, knowing that Bess would be getting worried about her. After some searching, she found a dessert cart and bought a peach ice cream cone. Nearby was a small bench nested in a quiet corner. She rested there while eating the sweet treat. To her amazement, Nancy spotted her friends in the distance. She yelled their names calling them over to her. Bess showed up with a huge teddy bear in her arms, beaming at Nancy. Look what Carter won for me. What a man. Nancy rolled her eyes in response, feeling no need to ask them to share their tale. Bess's expression suddenly changed to a more childish look as she sat down next to Nancy. They have a huge slingshot ride here but Carter won't ride it with me. Carter shot Bess a no-nonsense look, do what you want but I'm not riding that monster of an attraction. Bess pouted in response, as she looked down at the teddy bear in her lap. The next thing Nancy knew Bess was dragging her away. The sound of wild screams grew louder, as they continued along the pathway. They bobbed and weaved through the crowd until they were in line for the slingshot ride. Nancy took the attraction in, it was over fifty feet tall and covered in bright multicolor lights. The rock music blasting from the ride seemed almost deafening. Once she realized what Bess was trying to do, Nancy tried to get away. I do not want to go on this ride. Nancy tried to explain, however, 
Bess just tightened her grip on Nancy's arm. Nancy's heartbeat quickened as they moved up in the line. Once they were next in line, the young girl felt a sudden wave of fear rush over her. The ride was true to its name and looked like a giant slingshot with two seats made to face back. As the ride took off the riders yelled wildly, while flying high in the sky. The experience lasted for ten minutes before the ride came back down to earth. The riders did not look so well as they got off the ride and stumbled off into the crowd. The attendant came over to Nancy and Bess and led the way to the ride. Nancy tried to explain to Bess that she was too scared to ride but her voice was overwhelmed by the loud music. Bess looked very excited as they were strapped in unaware that Nancy was clawing the armrest desperate to escape. Good luck you will need it, yelled to the young man as he walked over and hit the button. A buzzer sounded, as they took off. Everything looked to be a blur as they were slung into the air. Nancy could hear Bess yelling as they reached the ride's maximum height. A second later, they started to spin forward as the seats shifted downward. Nancy closed her eyes when she felt them bolting upwards once more. The ride was not as wild as Nancy had expected but the heights still terrified her. To combat the fear, she closed her eyes and hung on for dear life. It seemed like an eternity before the ride came to a standstill. As he helped them get out of the ride the attendant asked, Would you like to ride again? In response, Nancy glared at him. She surprised to see Bess, her mascara had run all the way down her face from crying in fear. Nancy wore a disgusted look as she ran off into the crowd leaving Bess dumbfounded. Chapter 3 Nancy wandered around until coming upon a small park that looked out over a seawall. She sighed while leaning on the railing and staring out onto the ocean. Nancy knew that Bess had not meant any harm in what she had done. Still, she wondered, how could Bess treat her this way? Didn't their friendship mean something to her? Just then a powerful gust of wind played wildly with the stands of her strawberry blonde hair. Nancy took a step back from the railing to investigate her surroundings. She found herself to be in the historic district part of the city. So, she decided to go exploring and take in the unique sights and sounds of the area. Thankfully this part of the city had a calmer atmosphere and was not crowded. After walking about a mile she came across a small antique store. It had two large window displays that were full of old toys, colored glassware and an early 1900s-style typewriter. With her interest sparked Nancy entered the shop. Inside she felt as if she had been transported to another time. The store a dimly lit by old gas-burning wall sconces. Along the walls were large bookcases holding a multitude of leather-bound books in every size and color imaginable. While the middle of the store contained a few tables littered with antiques of every kind. In the far corner was an old Victrola record player with a large stack of dusty albums sitting beside it. Nancy walked around and browsed through the many rare items. She found some vintage, 20,000 leagues under the sea, postcards that she was sure her father would love. Verne was by far his favorite writer. She also paused to look through a few old books that littered the shop. What adventures did these old relics contain, she wondered. She paused to look through a few of the tomes and found one titled, From the Earth to the Moon, and pulled it out of the huge bookcase. As the young girl did, she noticed a bottle that had been hidden behind the book. What is this? Nancy asked picking up the dust-covered object. Taking some tissue out from her purse, she dusted the mystery bottle off. Inside was an amazingly detailed mermaid figure. It looked so lifelike with expressive features, individual hair strands, and even tiny scales visible. As she was examining the object it slipped from her hand. Time seemed to slow down, as it neared the floor, however, just before breaking it vanished. What? Where did it go? she exclaimed, confused. Looking for this, dear? asked a little old woman, who held up the bottle for Nancy to see. This woman had seemingly appeared out of nowhere. She looked to be in her seventies or possibly even older. 
With wispy white hair styled into a bun atop her head and piercing eyes the color amber, this woman was unusual in appearance. She wore a simple cream-colored dress cut in a vintage style and a thin braided belt that complemented her slender frame. Around her neck rested a long string of pearls, which reminded Nancy of the ones flapper girls used to wear. Nancy blinked as she noticed the glass bottle in the women's bony hands, yes. Why thank you. Nancy managed to say, still a little surprised. Listen, you must very careful with this. This is a very special one-of-a-kind piece, said the women through pursed lips as she held out the item for Nancy to take. It looks so real. Do you know who made it? Nancy asked with a weak smile as she held it in her hands. Yes, I do. Replied the woman as she sat down in a rocking chair near the front door. Nancy stepped closer to the women before asking, Would you mind telling me please? The old women began to rock back and forth before replying, If I must. That bottle was made by a local artist many years ago. This shop used to sell these by the dozen and for a short while, this city was famous for them. Sadly, the artist that created these died about forty years ago. She looked intently at the object before adding, that was the last one he ever created and in my opinion the most unique. What do you mean by unique? Nancy asked as she sat down on a small wooden chair. The crazy old coot claimed to have caught a glimpse of the mermaid of lore, once as a young sailor. He swore to have instantly fallen in love with her, tragically to never see the creature again. While it was still fresh in his mind, he drew a sketch of her, and then made this one figure in the likeness of her. Nancy wore a look of awe as she asked, What mermaid of lore? I have never heard of her before. Not many young people have, the woman replied giving Nancy a tired look as if she had shared this story too many times to count. Hundreds of years ago these waters were full of pirates and sailors galore. For many years these men told tales of a stunning young mermaid with long, curly, blonde hair and the most lovely seafoam-colored blue eyes. Some claimed the creature was a type of siren, who appeared from the depths only to lure men to a watery death, while others claimed her to a harmless ghost of a dead maiden who takes the form of a harmless mermaid. Said the old women before pausing for a moment. Nancy was on the edge of her seat in suspense. Since childhood, she had loved the tales of urban legends and Greek myths. Serena, as the many fishermen call her is said to live in Half Moon Cove. According to legend, one night the Black Swan, a large pirate ship, was seen in the area. They searched the area long and hard looking for some long-lost buried treasure. The captain's son, a mere 17-year-old, was left alone to guard the rowboat, as the others hunted on shore for the treasure. After a short while, the lab became bored and went off to explore the beach instead of during his job. Then he heard a woman crying off in the distance, following the sound along the beach led him right to Serena. She was trapped within a fisherman's net and had washed up on shore. He cut her free and two feel head over heels in love until. Nancy leaned forward as she asked, what happened next? She made the mistake of taking him to her cave. It was accessible from both the land and sea on a small inhabited island. Inside he found the vast treasure she had collected from hundreds of sunken ships. Being a pirate he could not resist the lure of the treasure. A few days later he returned, stole all of it, and then buried it on the island somewhere out of her reach to later return for it with the crew. The mermaid's broken heart and anger caused a powerful storm to form, it sunk the black pearl and killed everyone on board, said the old woman while she dried the small tears from her eyes. Is this cove somewhere nearby? asked Nancy, as she looked intently into the aged woman's eyes. The shopkeeper took one long deep breath before replying in a hushed tone, Yes, it is not but about thirty miles from here. You are not thinking about going there are you? Perhaps I will, Nancy replied. Quickly, the old woman's expression changed to one of curiosity. Then you must beware. Many still claim the legend of the mermaid to be true. From what I have heard, 
Serena only chooses to reveal herself to certain people. I hope she is not hungry when you visit. The woman's eyes had changed to steely gray and her face seemed to look older than it did when Nancy had first met her. Nancy thought this woman might be a little crazy. She changed to the subject, eager to leave, thanks very much for your time. How much do I owe you for the bottle and postcards? Hmm. It is one of a kind. Said the old woman as she seemed to think deeply on the subject. Then she looked deeply into Nancy's sparkling blue eyes and said, There is something different about you. Something special, not all can see. Tell you what, I've given them to you. Can I really keep this? asked Nancy. The old woman nodded in response. Then she wrapped the bottle up in several layers of old yellowed newspaper. Nancy caught a glimpse of the date on one it read, May 30, 1921. Once outside, she realized that her keys were still on the counter inside the store. Hello, I left my keys here. I'm just going to grab them and go, the girl said while entering once more. This time there was no answer as if the old woman had disappeared. Is it just me or is does this place look different than just five minutes ago? It almost looks as if this place has been abandoned for years. Nancy thought, as a slight chill ran down her spine. She grabbed her keys noticing that the one spotless counter was now covered in a thick layer of dust. Chapter 4 On the way back to the bed and breakfast, Nancy had noticed a local museum. It didn't look like much on the outside, however, she wondered what treasures awaited visitors. As she entered a small elderly man greeted her. She must have interrupted his lunch break because he came out of a doorway carrying a sub sandwich. After paying the five dollar fee to get in, Nancy made her way through the many exhibits. As you entered, there was a large mural on the wall of a harbor at sunset. Beneath the mural stood two large tanks. The first came up to waist height and was filled with many starfish and a few horseshoe crabs you could pet. The other tank was much larger and had a tight lid on top. It was meant to depict a natural tide pool and was filled with starfish, sea urchins, crabs, and many kinds of tiny fish. The next room was painted a sandy color and felt very calming. On the wall to the right were a large sign listing what seashells could be found in the area and their rarity. Down in cases below were examples of rare shells and even some sea glass. Nancy grabbed a pamphlet from the top of a display case. It listed how to find sea glass and shark teeth. It also talked about the best beaches in the area to find seashells and what time of day to look. Nancy explored the rest of the room. In the far corner was a massive driftwood sculpture. It looked to be a huge lion made of too many different pieces of wood to count. For eyes, it made pieces of amber that seemly glowed from within. On a large plaque in front was listed the title of the piece, Haggard Lion. It was crafted by the hands of an artist named Wesley Andre. The piece was said to be on loan from the Gibbies Museum of Art in Charleston, South Carolina. The piece was said to be on loan from the Gibbies Museum of Art in Charleston, South Carolina. Nancy visited many more exhibits in different parts of the museum. One room she visited held the history of the one small town, from its beginning to the present. Another area was designed for fun pics. With many props like a mermaid statue, rowboat, and large wooden board that was painted with a vintage pin-up model on the front. With many props like a mermaid statue, rowboat, and large wooden board that was painted with a vintage pin-up model on the front. In the last room, Nancy was surprised to find an exhibit dedicated to scuba diving. It contained many small tanks filled with native species of aquatic creatures. Nestled between a vending machine and antique diving suit from the early 1900s was a large diving mural. It portrayed a group of divers exploring a sunken warship as sharks circled above it. I had no idea England had a thriving underwater diving industry, she commented while studying the painting. See that castle hidden towards the bottom of the mural right there, said a young man who seemed to pop out of nowhere. 
This spooked Nancy, causing her to take a step back. Yes, what of it? She asked the man. He was about six feet tall, with tossed bleach blonde hair, cute dimples, and captivating hazel eyes. It was once on a cliffside that collapsed hundreds of years ago, he explained. Why would anyone want to build a castle on a cliff? That just seems stupid. Nancy replied. The guy grinned at her relay, then added, I thought the same thing at first. That is until my boss explained the true reason. It wasn't actually built on a cliff, to begin with. That seaside castle is so ancient that the waves and storms had eaten away at the earth until all that was left was a cliff beneath it. The whole thing is made of smooth black stone and it still has some of its stained glass windows remaining. You talk as if you've been there, she asked while looking up at him with curious eyes. Yes, as a matter of fact, I have visited there a few times. It is actually very close to the Mermaid Cove. I work as a sort of tour guide for Max's undersea wonders. He said before pulling a handful of hard candies from his pocket. What mermaid? Is it the one from the legend? She questioned. Yeah well sort of. Said the young man while roughing up his hair, lost in thought. It is a metal and stone statue that lies on the seafloor. But no no ones who put it there or why. Nancy was quiet for a moment as she thought. There had to be some kind of expiation for the statue being there. Some of the old-timers insist that a pirate sunk it there on purpose hoping to lure out some kind of creature. Oh, the other hand, most of the locals think that it was thrown overboard during a storm in an attempt to keep a merchant ship from sinking, he explained before checking his wristwatch. I'm sorry to cut this short but I was supposed to help my boss today. If I don't leave now I'm going to be late. Here take this if you are interested in going diving, he said before handing over a wrinkled flyer. Nancy watched him run out of the building. He was kind of cute but I didn't even catch his name. Nancy went outside and sat upon the museum's large concrete stairs, as opening up the flyer. It promised adventure, exploring, and a treasure. What kind of treasure, she wondered. Author's Note Asterisk Chapter 5 Later on that night, Nancy found herself standing on the front porch of the bed and breakfast. She took a deep breath to calm her racing thoughts, I guess it is time to go in and face the music. Whatever the outcome might be. She mustered up the courage to knock upon the wooden, shabby chic style door. I feel so hungry and want to go to bed, Nancy mumbled as she let out a long yawn. As Nancy started ahead, someone pulled back the window curtain carefully. There stood a cute little girl with long blonde hair and glowing green eyes. She could not have been any older than seven years old, Nancy thought. The child ran off before Nancy could protest. Nancy was feeling very lightheaded, she reached her arm out to lean against the wall. Why do I feel so tired? Her knees started to feel weak causing her to fell to the ground. Bess opened the door and exclaimed, Oh my god! It is Nancy. Carter come here and help. Nancy slowly started to wake up and hear her friends talking. I am so glad it is nothing life-threatening, said Crater. I do not know what any of us would do without her. Nancy really makes a difference in this world. By solving mysteries, Nancy has helped many families over the years. I hope to one day do the same. She is amazing but so are you. Just hold on to that dream of yours Bess. One day you will do something amazing, replied Carter. Nancy blinked her eyes and tried to sit up. Bess saw this, then rushed over to her friend's side. Nancy. Thank God you are awake, said Bess. I am so hungry, Nancy replied as she started to get up on the sofa. Here, have some water while I go to the kitchen and warm you up something to eat, Bess said while handing a glass over into Nancy trembling hands. Not long after this, Bess returned carrying a tray with a steaming bowl of stew on top of it. Thanks, Bess you are so sweet, said Nancy, as she took the tray from her friend. 
Now tell me where you were all day long. You just took off without telling me anything. Bess yelled, very upset. I did not really think you would notice that I was gone, Nancy said in between bites of food. Well, as long as you are all right that is all that matters, but don't take off like that again. Bess took a quick glance around the room to make sure Carter left, before adding, Tell me did you meet any hunky guys at the beach? Oh, I bet you did. What does he look like? Actually, I went shopping and then went to a local museum. There was a cute guy there, apparently, he works as a type of scuba diving tour guide. She answered before she took a sip of sweet tea. Bess continued to ask questions, so both girls were up until midnight before finally falling asleep. Early the next morning, as the sun had just begun to rise and the room was still filled with many strange shadows, Nancy was beginning to wake up. She turned back over in bed to shield her eyes from the daylight. She wanted to get up and going but her body refused to obey. Seemly, just moments later the sound of a drawer opening stirred her awake. Nancy blinked quickly trying to get her eyes to see clearly. Slowly she sat up and yawned. Bess was rapidly going through the room trying to get dressed. Bess, is something wrong? Nancy asked. Where is it? I had it just yesterday. I'm sure of it. Bess commented obviously very irritated. Perhaps I can help. What is it you are looking for? No, it is all right. I will find it, Bess replied. Nancy could take a hint, her friend obviously needed a little space. So she grabbed some clothing and quickly got changed into light gray shorts, a cute baby blue lace top, and some strappy sandals. This will do just fine. Nancy thought while twirling in front of a full-length mirror. Now to take on the world. A crumpled up piece of paper fell from the handbag as she grabbed it. What is that? she thought. She opened it to discover that it was the flyer that cute guy from yesterday had given her. This really does look like fun to do. Nancy grabbed an apple and some toast before sitting down to make the call in the kitchen. The phone rang five times and just before Nancy was about to hang up an older woman answered the phone. Thank you for calling the Surf and Turf Grill. How many will be in your party tonight? Oh, I am so sorry. This must be the wrong number. I was trying to reach a scuba diving company. Nancy said while playing with her long strawberry blonde locks. Oh no please do not hang up. We own that company too. We just bought it a few months ago and we do not have a phone line hooked up for it yet. All right, I would like to ask about what you offer for this area, Nancy asked. She talked to the women for about 30 minutes before scheduling a dive to see the mermaid statue and hopefully a shipwreck that was nearby. As Nancy was leaving she noticed a note from Bess saying she would be back in two hours so they could go together and have some fun in the sun. Nancy found that the lighting this time of day was perfect for photography. A hobby she truly had a passion for. In the park, there seemed to be college-age kids all around. Some were reading in the shade, others walking holding hands, two were busy doing yoga, and one guy was playing ultimate frisbee with his golden retriever. Oh a welcome challenge to photograph, she thought while pulling out the camera. It was an older model that had once belonged to her mother, who had died when she was but a small child. Nancy bent down to the ground to get a better shot of the animal as it jumped up in midair to catch the toy. Wow what an amazing photo. I can't wait to see how it turns out, Nancy thought. The dog seemed to grow tired of the game and decided to take off with the toy causing the owner to chase after him. Nancy could not help but laugh when the dog outwitted the man several times. Once her stomach started to hurt from the laughter the young girl walked over to the shade of a large palm tree. The grass was really lush and felt nice to rest on. Her thoughts seemed to disappear at that moment, as the sun helped to warm her skin and started to make Nancy feel drowsy. If I don't get up soon sleep with overtaking me, thought the girl. 
After a few more minutes her eyelids strayed to droop once again. That's when she overheard a conversation going in within earshot. Link did you see the newspaper yesterday, said a man's voice. Nancy looked over and noticed two men in their thirties sitting on a bench talking. At first, it did not sound very interesting to listen to but things soon changed. Yeah, it talked about the local crime spree. They say the police are baffled, voiced the tall guy with short, dark blonde hair and curly beard. I only know a little bit about from my co-workers. What is really going on? asked the other man with jet black hair and thick framed glasses. From what I have heard, they have been around for years operating in the shadows. The gang breaks into wealthy houses stealing expensive antiques and jewels. Then they sell the stuff on the black market and are very hard to trace, whispered the man. I am sure glad they have just been after the rich and have so far left the poor alone. Yeah, you are right. Nancy thought that, this crime spree could prove to be very interesting in the future, as she put the newspaper into her purse. Chapter 6 Nancy was sitting on the edge or a large stone fountain, enjoying the fresh air and calm atmosphere. Nancy played with the dancing waters with her fingertips, until she accidentally splashed cold water onto her clothing. This started Nancy, causing the teen to jump up to her feet. Just then someone ran into her, knocking her to the ground. A split second later, a young boy snatched her purse and ran. Nancy chased after him, failing to catch up. This kid is fast. Does he run track or something? Nancy wondered. She chased him down the street, into a dark alley. Perhaps not the best choice but they both soon emerged unharmed. The boy happened to look behind himself and was shocked to see Nancy, so he changed directions. Looks like he is trying to make it to the beach, thought Nancy. Nancy watched as the boy pushed his way through groups of people trying to escape. The child made a huge mistake when he pushed through a group of young men that looked to be just hanging out. To Nancy's surprise, one of the young men tackled the child to the ground. That purse is not yours, low life he exclaimed while managing to hold down the struggling child. You wimp let me go. I'll fight you fist to fist. You do not have a chance against me in a fair fight, the boy argued. Then he cried out in desperation, Jasper help me. You promised me protection if I worked with you. There was a sound like a gun being shot off in the distance and caused the young man to lose his grip on the child. The young thief managed to slip away without Nancy's purse. The young man frowned as he watched the boy run away. Turning to Nancy, gave her a small smile. The man was tall, had a slightly muscular build, with golden brown hair, and had jade green eyes. His face looked very similar. Where had she seen this hunky guy before? Perhaps from back in River Heights? No that could not be it, thought Nancy. I assume this is yours, said the young man, holding out her purse. Nancy took her bag back and smiled at him. I am Nancy, by the way, and thank you so much for your help. Kids these days are just plain wild. So tell me fair maiden what were you doing when that boy robbed you? You seem too quick-witted to outsmarted by a mere child, he said before leaning back a bit. I was knocked off guard by another boy that ran into me, resulting in the thief taking advantage of the opportunity and running off with my bag, she said as she sat down on a bench and patted the spot next to her, and you are mister, she joked lightly and smiled. He looked at her strangely for a second before responding, my name is Ryan. I'm a local in this area. He slowly sat down beside her, rubbing his against hers. Sorry about that. In response, Nancy blushed before adding, I am here for a short vacation with a few friends. Ryan leaned closer, I was right then. I guessed you were not from here. Is it that obvious? Yeah, it is. I noticed you walking around earlier and not seeming to know where you were going, he chuckled slightly. Nancy went to push herself up but slid down instead. 
I guess I am more worn out than I first thought. Will you help me up, she asked while holding an hand out in his direction. At first, he seemed surprised, then he smiled and said in a charming tone, anything for you, darling. Later on, Nancy was walking with Ryan, she said, since first meeting you, I have had the feeling that I meet you before. I just can't seem to shake that feeling. Ryan looked thoughtful for a moment before replying, perhaps, we meet before in another life. Nancy laughed and nudged his arm with her elbow. That is a silly notion. Ryan scrubbed his shoulders, from what I have heard, some people believe in it and religiously. In response, Nancy rolled her eyes. She let her gaze scan over his body and blushed. Come to think of it, I met a really cute guy yesterday as well. Nancy thought to herself. Are you okay? You look stressed. Ryan asked as he waved his hand in front of her face. Nancy was surprised, I'm just fine. I was lost in thought for a moment. Gotta be careful doing that. Deep thinkers are known to miss out on a lot in life by not paying enough attention to the world around them. Nancy smiled and stuck out her tongue at him, now who sounds like the deep thinker? Ryan flicked her on the nose playfully. Nancy looked him in the eye as she said, I remember meeting someone yesterday that looked a lot like you. Did he appear to be my double or just looked similar? Ryan asked wearing a look of concern. Come to think of it, he looked like you but with blonde hair and hazel eyes, Nancy explained. Ryan shifted his weight from foot to foot and seemed to become agitated as she spoke. He works at a scuba diving company around here. Could you be related? Nancy asked. Right now is not the best time to get into that. The Ryan tried to say when his friends came back up. Hey, we caught him. The squirt thought he had lost us when he hid under a jeep but we could still see his bright red shoes under there. The police have him right now. One of the young men explained. Oh, that is great. I guess a call needs to be made to tell the police to be on the lookout for the accomplice. Ryan suggested. Can you tell me where the nearest payphone is? I would be happy to make the call. Nancy asked the group. I'm sorry Nancy but I need to get to work, Ryan explained as he turned to leave with the group of guys. That is okay. I will see you again. Nancy replied. Chapter 7 As Nancy was walking with Ryan, she said, Since first meeting you, I have had the feeling that I meet you before. I just can't seem to shake that feeling. Ryan looked thoughtful for a moment before replying, Perhaps, we meet before in another life. Nancy laughed and nudged his arm with her elbow. That is a silly notion. Ryan scrubbed his shoulders, from what I have heard, some people believe in it and religiously. In response, Nancy rolled her eyes. She let her gaze scan over his body and blushed. Come to think of it, I met a really cute guy yesterday as well. Nancy thought to herself. Are you okay? You look stressed. Ryan asked as he waved his hand in front of her face. Nancy was surprised, I'm just fine. I was lost in thought for a moment. Gotta be careful doing that. Deep thinkers are known to miss out on a lot in life by not paying enough attention to the world around them. Nancy smiled and stuck out her tongue at him, now who sounds like the deep thinker. Ryan flicked her on the nose playfully. Nancy looked him in the eye as she said, I remember meeting someone yesterday that looked a lot like you. Did he appear to be my double or just looked similar? Ryan asked wearing a look of concern. Come to think of it, he looked like you but with blonde hair and hazel eyes, Nancy explained. Ryan shifted his weight from foot to foot and seemed to become agitated as she spoke. He works at a scuba diving company around here. Could you be related? Nancy asked. Right now is not the best time to get into that. The Ryan tried to say when his friends came back up. Hey, we caught him. 
The squirt thought he had lost us when he hid under a jeep but we could still see his bright red shoes under there. The police have him right now. One of the young men explained. Oh, that is great. I guess a call needs to be made to tell the police to be on the lookout for the accomplice. Ryan suggested. Can you tell me where the nearest payphone is? I would be happy to make the call. Nancy asked the group. I'm sorry Nancy but I need to get to work, Ryan explained as he turned to leave with the group of guys. That is okay. I will see you again. Nancy replied. When Nancy arrived back at the inn, she witnessed Carter come running out the front door. He was carrying a set of suitcases and then threw them into the back seat of a yellow taxi cab. What in the world is going on here? Nancy asked as she ran up to the scene. Carter turned to look at Nancy with anger burning in his eyes. Then he yelled, that girl is unreasonable. I cannot take it anymore. As Carter claimed into the back of the cab he added, I am going back the States. Sorry girls, I'm afraid that you two are on your own. He then turned to the driver, all right, let's go. I need to go to the airport. Nancy took a step back from the curb and watched as the taxi drove away. It's not like Carter to blow up like this. I better go find Bess and find out what has happened. Nancy thought. She found Bess upstairs in their room. The teen was sobbing into a soft pillow as she lay across the bed. Nancy knocked on the door frame and asked, Bess, can I come in? It is your room too. I do not plan on stopping you, Bess replied. Nancy sat right down next to her friend. Bess do you need to talk about it? I am right here if you need me. Nancy cooed while she lightly rubbed Bess's trembling back. Now what happened to cause all this? I am afraid that you would not believe me if I told you, Bess replied her sobbing becoming a little quieter. You know that is not true. Bess, I have always believed you. Bess slowly sat up pouting as she looked at Nancy. He cheated on me, Nancy, Bess said in between sobs. Nancy was taken back because that did not sound like something Carter would do. Now what exactly happened? Nancy asked trying to get a better understanding of the situation. Bess lied back down on the bed. Looking up at the ceiling, she explained, we went out to eat together. Everything was fine until I went to powder my nose. Upon returning, I found him sitting at the table and flirting with a stunningly beautiful woman. Bess dried her teary eyes on the edge of the bedsheet. Carter had a terrified look upon his face when he noticed me. Then I ran out of the restaurant only to come back here. Not long after he came up here talk but all we ended up doing was arguing. In the end, Carter packed his bags to go back home. Oh, I am so sorry, Nancy said while hugging Bess. Go take a hot shower it might help you feel a little better. Bess stood up and walked towards the bathroom. You know that is the best idea I have heard all day. Thank you, Nancy. About an hour later Bess came out from the bathroom. She looked a little better, however, her eyes were still red. How about a trip to the beach today? You know there will be some super cute guys there. I do not feel like it today. I just need some rest. Oh come on Bess. It would be fun. I will not give up until you agree to come along, Nancy said giving Bess a little wink. No, I would rather just stay here and watch some TV, Bess replied. Nancy jumped onto the bed and started to tickle her friend, which made Bess laugh. You need some fresh air to clear your head. Finally, Bess replied, all right. Stop my tummy hurts from all the laughter. I will go, but after a short nap. You are a huge pest when you want to be Nancy Drew. In response, Nancy just smiled. Chapter 8 The shifting sand felt wonderful under Nancy's bare feet as she walked along the shore. She paused and bent down every once in a while to examine the seashells that littered the beach. 
This time she had found a shell that resembled a fish scale. It was round, very shiny, and thin for a seashell. These jingle shells remind me of mermaid scales, Nancy said as she held it up for Ryan to see. I recently learned of a romantic myth that is native to this region that involves a pirate and mermaid. Have you ever heard of it before? Yes, I have. Every local worth their salt knows about it. Ryan said, as he glanced over at Nancy, before turning back towards the vast grayish ocean. Overhead seabirds circled hunting for anything edible that a messy tourist might have left behind. I was told the legend comes from a small cove not far from here, she added. For some strange reason, this tale had captured Nancy's interest and she needed to learn more about it. Yeah, it does. Honestly, there are a lot of strange tales from that area. What kind of strange tales? Well, other tales of mermaids of course. Then there are a few sightings of a large snake-like creature that is said to live at the bottom of the cove. It is said to attack animals and drags them into its watery lair. He pulled a few unopened cinnamon discs from his pocket and offered Nancy some. She happily took one. It proved to be way hotter than she had expected. It made her begin to sweat and her eyes teared up. Is this cove beautiful with lots of fun things to do? In some areas it is. The north side is developed with lots of attractions. He paused for a moment, then said, the other side is pretty quiet and is a great area for catching sea bass. The only place that you would need to stay away from is the old ruins. Are there really ruins around here? Nancy asked as her eyes light up with excitement mirroring those of a small child. What kind of ruins are they and why should everyone stay away? Nancy was squirming with excitement as she asked. Ryan flashed Nancy a questioning look before adding, there are ruins of an ancient garden surrounded by low stone walls, however, the winds are usually too strong for anyone to visit that area without being blown right off the side of the cliff. Suddenly, he took hold of Nancy's hands and said, the most dangerous place to visit in these parts is the Maiden's Isle. The small island is said to be haunted by the countless victims of the great pirate Blackbeard. He loved to drown and slay his captives whose families could not pay a ransom. Don't tell me you believe those old tales. Come on they are just a bunch of nonsense. Nancy joked, as she playfully punched his muscular arm. Ryan looked away from her and down at the ground as he replied, I never really put much faith in those old wives' tales, until recently. Over the past year, I have seen some strange things in that area that can't be explained. A lot of people have also heard horrible screams coming from that island. My best friend, Nate even has a blurry picture of a ghostly figure along walking that beach in the light the full moon. He's far too terrified to visit there anymore. I need to get back to the inn. My friend and I have plans tonight. She caught Ryan staring at her and he quickly looked away. Nancy thought she could see a little pink blush on his cheeks. Before we go, I meant to ask you why do you have an American accent if you grew up here? Nancy asked. My family is originally from California but we moved here when my grandmother grew ill and weak. After her death, my parents decided to stay here. They felt uprooting their kids once more was a terrible idea and dreaded having to change jobs again. This place is so beautiful. It is perfect for taking lots of breathtaking photos. Nancy said tiring to change the subject. Believe me, it gets boring after living here for a few years, Ryan replied. Then he lifted up his right hand to block the bright sun out of his eyes. As he moved, Nancy noticed a cute little heart-shaped birthmark on his right shoulder blade. Would you let me walk you back to the inn? I do not like the idea of you wandering around all by yourself. Ryan asked. I would love that thank you. Once the were not for from the inn, Nancy exclaimed, Hey look. There is Bess. Bess standing in front of a small coffee shop with a few guys gathered around her. They seem to be arguing about something. Wait something does feel right, 
Ryan announced before dashing off to investigate. Nancy followed close behind but struggled to keep up with his fast pace. Just leave me alone. Bess yelled at a young man who seemed to be the gang leader. The group of three guys was rough-looking with tattoos all over their bodies, painful-looking piercings, and shaven heads. One guy blocking Bess's escape, oh come on doll face, I will not hurt ya. Let's go for a long drive. He said. Then he grabbed Bess's wrist and tried to pull her towards a car. Why you little, said the guy pulling on Bess, as Ryan came up and grabbed him by the forearm. Ryan twisted the arm causing the gang leader to cry out loudly in pain. The man managed to twist loose from Ryan by wigging like crazy. Then he turned sharply and tried to sucker punch Ryan in the gut but missed. One of the other gang members stepped forward to say, hang in there, we will tag team them. Nancy watched as this guy rushed forward to grab Ryan. Oh no, you do not. Nancy yelled as she jumped on the guy's back. She held on tight around his neck effectively choking him. Meanwhile, Bess was quietly sneaking up on the other guy from behind. Boo! Bess yelled into his ear then she kicked him hard in the groan. He buckled at the knees and whimpered in pain. Ryan was just about to get kicked when Bess came to his aid by surprising the enemy. She did this by screaming like a madwoman at the top of her lungs. This gave Ryan enough time to duck and quickly hit the guy. The thug went head first right into the sand and got in his eyes. Come on guys let's get out of here. The busty blonde is not worth all this trouble. He yelled while staggering away. Nancy's hold around her victim's neck losses allowing him to scream, Boss. This girl is nuts. Get her off me. Then Nancy jumped off the guy's back and kicked him in the balls. Wincing in pain, he to the ground. That was unexpected. Good thing Ryan was here to help us. Nancy commented. Yeah, thanks so much. You helped save my life. I hate to think what those creeps might have done to me. Bess added with a warm smile. The young man just blushed at the attention. So, why were you two all by yourselves earlier? You were not making plans to elope together. Bess teased Nancy and Ryan. You mean us? Nancy asked with an innocent look on her face. Why don't you fill her in Ryan, she asked him. All we did was take a walk along the beach and talk about the area's weird history. If you say so, Bess replied seemingly unconvinced that Ryan and Nancy were just friends. Chapter 9 The next morning, Nancy tiptoed over to Bess's bed only to jump up and down on it. Nancy, it will not hurt to let me sleep in for thirty more minutes, Bess whined as she tried to burrow deeper into the covers. There is no time to sleep late. This place charged a fee if we show up tardy. So get up off your lazy bun. Nancy replied as she threw Bess her bathing suit, a cute pair of loose shorts, a peach-colored t-shirt, and a pair of strappy sandals. Once they were dressed, Nancy hurried Bess into a cab that was waiting outside. Slow down, there is no fire. Bess complained half-yawning. We still need to go pick up an underwater camera that I called ahead and renting for the next few days, she explained. Nancy tapped the driver on the shoulder then said, to the B&B &B camera incorporated please and step on it. The driver took her seriously and they shot forwards pushing the girls back into their seats. So give a little hint where we are headed. Not knowing is driving me crazy. Hmm. Let me think about it for a minute. She said pausing and pretending to be thinking really hard about it to tease Bess. We will be exploring the area with a tour guide. Bess shifted in her seat and turned to look out the window. A walk around the area with a tour guide does sound kind of interesting. Nancy just hoped Bess would not show out when she learned that the tour was to take place underwater. It did not take Nancy long to run in and pick up the camera. 
It was an impressive model with an interchangeable wide-angle and multi-purpose lens. They even included a small carrying bag to help keep it safe. A few minutes later the girls were back on the road head towards the diving shop. It was located near the beach and was a short drive. They pulled up outside the shop that looked more like a beach shack. It had a large sign that appeared to be made out of driftwood that stated the hours and tour locations. Nancy, why are we here? We are supposed to be going on a guided tour of the city. Just then Bess noted the sign and a look of dismay showed on her face. Ah oh, no. I am not going on an underwater tour, she argued. Bess you have never even given it a try. I bet you will love it. Nancy said as she smirked mischievously. Well you can just forget about it there is no way you ever get me to do. Bess paused mid-sentence, seeming transfixed on something behind Nancy. Bess looked as if she was in a state of sheer awe. She started to mumble senselessly under her breath. Earth to Bess. Hello, are you there? Nancy said as she waved a hand in front of her friend's face. Finally, she turned to see what Bess was gazing at. To her surprise, it was the cute guy she had to meet at the museum the day before. He had just come out of the building and was walking over to them. So glad you could make it. I thought you changed your mind about the dive. He said as while pulling off a pair of aviator sunglasses to reveal a pair of stunning hazel eyes. Bess started to mumble beside Nancy once again. It is nice to see you again. I am afraid that I did not catch your name last time we met. Nancy said with a smile while she elbowed Bess in an effort to snap the girl out of her trance. Oh yeah, sorry about that doll. I am Chase by the way and who is your friend here, he asked as he glanced towards a nervous Bess. This is one of my best friends, Bess Marvin and I am. The one and only Nancy Drew, the famous girl detective, Chase exclaimed as he threw his arms up in the air dramatically. Yeah, but why would you know that? she asked as she raised up an eyebrow. Well when I noticed the name given for the tour today, I recognized it from the media. My father did as well and helped fill me in on who you are. Apparently, he is a big fan of yours. He explained as he led the girls inside the shop. Now please sign these consent forms and then we can find you some gear. In no time the girls signed the papers and then handed them back. Chase then lead them into a large back room filled with all kinds of diving gear. First we need to find you both a wetsuit. They only come in five different sizes, extra small, small, medium, large and extra large. Chase explained as he showed them around. Nancy chooses a black and teal wetsuit while Bess liked a white and pink one. Next, the girls tried on flippers. Lastly, Chase handed them some steel air tanks, respirators, and vests to wear. You wear the vest to help keep you balanced in the water so you float midway in the water instead of having to continually swim. Like fish do with their gas bladders, the young man tried to explain. Bess did not seem to get it very well but nodded anyway. All right girls, just go put on your wet suits and meet me out at the blue jeep out front, he instructed before grabbing the heavy gear, carrying it outside with ease. Chapter 10 Once they were in the dressing rooms Bess confessed, Nancy I do not think I can do this. Bess, have some faith in yourself. What if I mess up? I will feel like such a fool in front of Chase and die of embarrassment. Bess whined. You normally have every guy around drooling over you. Believe me, you will be okay. Nancy urged. I do not know what is wrong with me. Nancy, you never get this way over a guy. I have felt the same way you do about Chase. When I first meet Frank Hardy, I was so shy that I could not even speak. Nancy said before heading back outside in her wet suit. She found Chase sitting the driver of a gray jeep. He turned on the radio as she walked up to get inside. A few minutes later out Bess walked out and the three were on their way. So where are we headed? Bess asked. 
a little place the locals like to call Mermaid Cove. There are all sorts of interesting fish that live in that area. Chase explained. Sounds like fun, I cannot wait. Nancy replied. The three teens enjoyed listening to the surfer music that was playing on the radio as they traveled. Nancy pulled out her camera and tried to take some pictures. She had no idea how they would turn out since the camera was made for underwater photography but it was worth a try. Look you can see all the small boats out on the water, Bess said as she pointed to show the way. Those are small shrimping boats, Chase explained as he slowed down to take a tight curve. This road proved to be bumpy causing girls had to tighten their seat belts. Oh dear God please do not let me get car sick, Nancy said as she began to turn a shade of green. Chase brought the jeep to a smooth stop near a small pier. He got the gear out and led the way to a black speedboat named the Storm. Once on the boat, Chase drove around a while to let the girls have a little fun and cool off from the long car drive. They to a secluded diving spot not far from shore where the waves were gentle. Right here the water is shallow. I brought you here to see how well you do before taking you out any deeper. He eyed the girls, there is a short-range radio made into the system if you need any help. Chase carefully checked their setup for any hazards. Now have either of you girls dived before? Chase asked as the ocean breeze blew gently through his golden hair almost making Bess swoon. I have once before in Hawaii but this is the first time for Bess, Nancy replied. Now remember if your regulator comes out underwater grab it with your right hand and it plays back to your mouth while exhaling, he explained while miming the actions. On most dives, you will not have any form of radio communication so learning the hand signals will be very helpful in the future. Just make an OK sign when everything is alright. If something is wrong to stick your hand out and wiggle it from side to side. Thumbs up means, let's surface, or thumbs down to, signal to dive down deeper. He turned to Nancy and motioned for her to get into the water. She did so by falling backward off the side of the boat. Bess reached out and tapped Chase on the shoulder, is there another way to get into the water? She bit her lip awaiting an answer. He looked surprised, you will do just fine if you give it a try, doll. Bess stared at Chase. Was he even being serious? Chase was silent for a moment until a sheepish smile appeared on his face. Before Bess could react, he quickly pushed her off the boat. Once Bess resurfaced, she asked, why in the world did you do that? Chase just ignored her and got into the water as well. Bess you have to admit that was kind of fun, Nancy joked. In response, Bess just pouted and looked away. Chase dived under the water with the girls following suit. He swam beside them to show how to use the flippers effectively. It took Bess a while to adjust to being underwater but was soon doing well for a newbie. You are privileged to be able to experience this firsthand. Most people will only glossé this world in photos or on their television, however, is no substitute for seeing this firsthand. Chase explained over the radio. Nancy enjoyed studying the different kinds of starfish along the cove's sandy floor as best practiced doing underwater somersaults and spinning turns. Nancy could not resist pulling out the camera to take some pictures of Bess. Otherwise, no one back home would ever believe Bess was brave enough to do this. Chapter 11 Chase showed them which animals never to mess with like coral, sea urchins, seals, large dolphins, and jellyfish. Once both girls seemed to be doing really well he took them back up to the surface. They had to take off their flippers and toss them into the boat, before being able to climb up the narrowboat ladder. The group rested a bit and sipped on some lilt soda before heading to the next diving location. This area was very different from the first location. It was full of coral and fish in every color of the rainbow. There were even some small sea turtles in the area, which the girls gravitated towards. Nancy pulled out the camera and was taking multi-shot pictures as Bess gently grabbed hold of the turtle's shell and tried to pet it. 
Chase swam up behind them and snatched the turtle away before it could bite Bess. Keep in mind, sea turtles cannot withdraw into their shells and will bite when feeling threatened, he warned after letting the creature go. The three of them had fun posing and taking pictures of each other for a while before heading off to the seaweed forest. The girls felt hesitant to enter, afraid of what awaited them inside. Believe me there is nothing to worry about, Chase said. No thank you. If need be we will wait right here. Bess stammered. Chase shook his head. If you insist then wait right there. It is your loss though because there is something amazing hidden beyond the seaweed. He said before disappearing into the undersea foliage. So Chase entered it without them. The two girls tried to wait outside afraid of what might be hidden inside the greenery. After a short while of twirling their thumbs, the girls became bored. How long do you think we have T wait for his return? Bess asked as she looked to Nancy. He has to come out sooner or later, Nancy replied crossing her arms. Just then a large form passed over their heads, casting a fast-moving shadow on the sand. Bess looked up only to spot a shark. Nancy, is that what I think, I.T., is? she asked while pointing to the creature. It is probably a harmless species that feed on small fry, Nancy commented, however, as the creature grew closer it became evident that it was a huge beast that looked to be ten feet long. I don't think sharks get that big just from eating the small fry, Bess said as she hid behind Nancy. Nancy pushed Bess in the direction of the seaweed forest. You are right. We need to get to cover. Chase, can you hear me? Hello, Chase. We need you. Bess said over the radio as the two girls swam behind a boulder for cover. With no response from Chase, Nancy commented, I think he must be out of the range of the radio. So we need to move closer to where he currently is. The two waited until the shark was out of sight before they swam into the seaweed. Once inside, the girls ventured deeper until they a small clearing. That was when something grabbed Bess's shoulder. She yelled and fought, however, when she turned around there was Chase smirking at her. You huge jerk. Why I oughta knock your block off. She fumed. In response, he just laughed and motioned for them to follow. The girls explained what had happened with the shark as they traveled. To their surprise, Chase did not seem too concerned. The area they were in now felt like a huge over-the-grown maze. Along the way, Nancy noticed many different kinds of seashells and something that looked like wreckage. Where could he be leading them she wondered. Once they emerged from the greenery, Nancy was surprised to see an old shipwreck. The boat was laying on its right with a huge hole in its side. She wondered what mysteries it held. Nancy swam closer to investigate and then ventured inside. She found it empty of life, except for some small reef fish who had decided to take refuge here. After doing a thorough search she found an old boot, broken glass, rotted books, and an overturned table that sat right in the center of the room. On the far left wall was an elaborate carving of a wild griffin scoring in the sky. On closer expectation, different colored glass stones were embedded in the wood. This is very elaborate, she commented. Nancy also found similar carvings around the boat that seemed to indicate the change of seasons. It cannot be that easy, she stated while pressing the green stone which symbolized springtime. It moved slightly. Next, she pushed the red for summer, orange for fall, finally the white one for winter. There was a cracking sound as part of the carving slide opened to reveal a message in a bottle. After retrieving the bottle, Nancy reached into the small hole to see if anything else was hidden there. At the very back, she could feel something with her fingertips. She pulled the item free to find that it was a small leather pouch with a tarnished silver pocket watch inside. Upon closer inspection, strange symbols decorated the top of the pocket watch. Nancy turned it over in her hands to try to find an inscription. Unfortunately, it was in a foreign language making it impossible for her to read. 
Off in the distance, a creature waited in the dark. It eyed the female that seemed unaware of the danger, so the creature chose this moment to attack. Nancy's eyes widened, as a huge shark came into view and went right for her. The world seemed to slow to a painful halt as Nancy was trapped like a deer in headlights unable to move, speck, or turn away. All she could do was stare into the of the creature's soulless evil eyes as it shot forward like a bullet. Nancy closed her eyes and prepared for the worst. Right right at the last moment, something came in on the radio. Nancy where are you? It is starting to get dark. It was Bess. This was just enough to snap Nancy back to reality. In the blink of an eye, she was somehow able to dodge the attack. She took this moment to swim over and hide behind a broken table that lay near a dark corner. Across the room, the shark's powerful long tail churned the water and sand causing the area to become murky. Nancy held her breath praying it would move on. The shark swam in circles around the room as if trying to figure out what had just occurred. Another message came on to the radio, Nancy, it is Chase. Please answer back. Nancy did not answer fearing in doing so it would give away her location. So instead she turned off the sound on the radio and searched the room for anything that could help her escape. A tin can and an old leather shoe, oh how helpful, she thought sarcastically. As Nancy felt along the wall, she found a small handle. By pulling it hard and it budged a few inches revealing an opening. To buy her some time to pry the compartment open, Nancy picked up the tin can and filled it with sand to give it some weight. Then she threw it hard against a wall. This distraction gave her just enough time to pull open the hatch and slide inside. After pulling the hatch closed she felt around the small dark space and concluded it to be a large wooden cabinet made into the ship. She waited silently in the darkness until she felt it had been long enough for the shark to have left to call her friends for help over the radio. Chapter 12 After arriving back at the inn, Nancy indulged in a relaxing hot shower. Then washed the tangles from her strawberry blonde hair and turned off the water to get out the shower. She got dressed into some to some peach-colored pajamas that were trimmed with white lace. As she opened the bathroom door it released the steam that was trapped, thus creating a short-lived fog. Nancy giggled when she spotted Bess, the poor girl was so exhausted that she had fallen asleep fully clothed on top of her bed. Nancy carefully pulled off Bess's shoes and pulled a thin quilt from the trunk at the end of the bed. She draped it over her sleeping friend before heading down to the kitchen for a light snack. Once there, she searched for a glass to pour some cold milk in. As the girl searched around a newspaper that was lying askew on top of the kitchen table caught her attention. The headline read that the Third Eye Gang was being blamed once again in many robberies around town. Nancy sat down to read more of the long article carefully. Apparently, a large group of criminals had been robbing the area for the past year. The police were baffled, they originally thought a local street punk was to blame but there was little to no evidence to base that theory on. The Third Eye members always robbed the homes of the wealthy, antique shops, and museums. The long list of stolen items included numerous nautical maps, a few metal swords, and many different kinds of antique jewelry pieces in the shape of keys. Strangely enough, all the items stolen were from around the 1700s. This did not seem like the work of a run-of-the-mill gang. It appeared to be done by someone way more knowledgeable than a common street rat. Could this be connected to the mermaid's treasure somehow, she thought. Then Nancy took the magnifying glass from her pocket to examine the pocket watch more closely. The top seemed to be decorated with the signs of the zodiac but some of the symbols were incorrect. That is strange. Why would someone want a watch like this in the first place? Nancy turned it over in her hands. The back looked plain and insignificant except for a small Gemini sign etched in the cold metal. She took the time to turn the little knob on the watch but it would not work. 
Nancy guessed water damage and rust was the cause of it being broken. Nancy unfolded the parchment from the bottle and laid it flat onto the tabletop. Why is it blank? Nancy exclaimed frustrated. She stood up, paced the room, and ran her fingers through her damp hair. Why in the world would someone go through all the trouble of hiding this for no reason? This makes no sense at all. Nancy thought before sitting back down. The girl sighed deeply, then absent-mindlessly looked up at the ceiling. Wait what if it is written in invisible ink? Remembering a scene from an old movie Nancy looked for orange juice or anything acidic. Knowing that the citrus acid should react with the ink and made the writing appear. She found a lemon and sliced it in half before rubbing the fruit onto the paper on both sides. Then she took a step back and waited for the magic to happen. After about ten minutes had passed she exclaimed, why is this not working? Pausing to reflect, allowed her to remember the most important step it takes to reveal such a message. It needs to be heated for the final step in the process. After turning the stove eye on low heat, she carefully waved the parchment over it, thus revealing a large hand-drawn cancer symbol. Nancy looked again at the pocket and focused on the cancer symbol engraved in the metal. Hidden in the intricate design was a tiny button. She carefully used the point of a knife to press the button. As she did this, the back slowly opened to reveal an inscription that appeared to be Roman writing. Nancy sighed, then put the trinket back in her pocket. It is too late to out anything else tonight. Might as well go to bed, Nancy concluded as she lazily made her way back upstairs. Chapter 13 The next day, Nancy found the scuba shack number and scheduled another trip for the next day, bright and early. Next, she borrowed a phone book from the innkeeper then called the local collage to ask for the language professor. He was an expert in many languages and agreed to take a look at the watch later on that day. Nancy, come on you need to get changed. I have the whole day planned for us, said Bess as she walked into the room. She was dressed in cute gray shorts and a white lace-covered top. You do. But why go through so much trouble? Nancy asked. You planned yesterday's trip and now it is my turn, Bess said as she grabbed Nancy's hand to gently pull her towards the door. Come on or I'll leave you behind all by yourself again. Oh, okay. Just let me get dressed first. Nancy went over to her suitcase and pulled out some white knee pants along with a pink ruffled tank top. An hour later, Bess was leading Nancy around by the hand. Now do not open your eyes until I say so. Just me a clue, the excitement is killing me, Nancy begged. No just wait. You will find out soon enough. Just a little longer. Okay, I trust you. After a short while, they stopped. Then Bess let go of her hand but did not say anything. Bess, can I take this thing off yet? Nancy waited for an answer but did not get one. So she took off her blindfold to find herself alone in a dimly lit hallway. Nancy was very worried. She walked along the hall and saw a curtain up ahead. She paused before trying to part it, only to find that lay on the other side blew her mind. It was as if she walked into some kind of wonderland. What looked like hand-painted pictures from the original Alice in Wonderland book hung on the walls. All around her waiters were dressed up like charterers from the book. Bess! Bess! Where are you? Nancy called. In response, someone shouted, Boo! from behind her. Nancy jumped but was grabbed by the arm. She quickly turned to see who had grabbed her, to find Bess standing there. That was way too easy, Bess said as she snickered. Nancy shook her head in frustration, all right you got me good this time. I will admit that. She took another look around the room taking in the scenery, before asking, where are we? A very special restaurant called the Mad Tea Party. I overheard some girls talking about this place the other day and just had to bring you here. Bess explained gleefully while leading Nancy over to a table in the corner of the room. 
This place is awesome, Nancy commented before a waitress dressed as Alice walked up to their table. Welcome to Wonderland, where everything is upside down. Just ring this tiny little bell when you're ready to order or need anything, said the waitress in English accent. Next, she handed them some fancy menus made to look like vintage leather-bound books. This place specializes in teas and sweets, however, I have heard they make a great beef stew as well, Bess added before looking over the menu. Nancy rang the tiny little bell and waited for the waitress to appear. Then she asked, what is the London particular? A delightful soup made from pork, peas, and onions. It is on special today and is half price. Sounds great I take one and two Wonderland top hat cupcakes please. Bess looked up from the menu to say, I will have the grilled chicken with strawberry sorbet for dessert. As the waitress took back the menu she asked, what can I get you to drink? Nancy and Bess both replied simultaneously, peach tea please. As the girls waited on their orders, the staff put on a quick show for the customers by acting out a scene from Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. The cast gathered around a long table in the middle of the room where the Mad Hatter and March Hare were seated. They reenacted the Mad Tea Party scene from the Disney film and then they all sung together with the song, A Very Happy Unbirthday. The performance was hilarious and caused the whole room to burst into laughter. Nancy and Bess were having a wonderful time until the bill arrived. $22 for just the two of us. This is crazy. Nancy exclaimed. I do not have that kind of money on me. Bess do you? she asked worriedly. Let me check my purse. Bess started to pull many different items from her purse. In a few minutes, the table was covered in makeup, receipts, and unused tissues. The staff and other customers had noticed their stranger behavior and were giving them nasty looks. A man dressed up as the white rabbit approached their table and asked, Are you ready to leave? I regret to inform you that we need this table for other guests. He stood there looking down at them with an annoyed look upon his face. Both girls gulped. They were in trouble and the last thing these girls needed was to get the local police called. Chapter 14 Both girls were in a panic. They could feel the cold stare from the white rabbit waiter. Nancy tried desperately to think of some simple solution. But what could she do? If only she had Ryan's phone number, maybe he would help. The waiter tapped his fingertips on the table rapidly more than eager for an answer. Perhaps I should call the manager over here to sort this out. There will be no need for that, sir. My friend and I have not had dessert, yet. Nancy declared as she attempted to buy them so time. She held the dessert menu and glanced it over. The waiter raised his eyebrow amused by their strange behavior. This looks pretty good. I would like two slices of apple pie and Bess will have a mini strawberry shortcake. Nancy said. The man sighed and headed to the kitchen. Bess glared at her friend. What do you think you are doing? The bill is already high enough. We cannot even pay for it now. Have you gone mad? Calm down Bess. We are just trying to buy some time to plot a solution. Now make sure to eat that dessert slowly. I think that we will also need to act as if we are having a great time. Bess got the message and begun to chat about her last phone call with her cousin, George. Apparently the athletic teen had won the marathon quite easily. She managed to earn a thousand bucks for the charity run in the process. George is truly an amazing person. I just do not see where she gets all that energy from. Nancy added. It's genetic from her father's side of the family. They are all very accomplished athletes. Nancy rose up from her seat to head to the restroom, while Bess waited on their food to arrive. Once it did she took her time nibbling. Are you not enjoying your dessert, miss? Questioned the white rabbit waiter with a sly grin on his face. Why yes, I am enjoying it. Please give my compliments to the chief. Bess replied. 
Once Nancy had come back to the table she whispered, I think we are going to have to run out on the bill. Once we get back to the inn I will arrange to have a money order and a note sent back here to make things right. That is not going to work they are watching us. Then we need a distraction of some sort. Nancy added. That was when Bess noticed a sign that said a performance would be held at two o'clock. That was just twenty more minutes until then. The girls waited until the lights dimmed and the cast began to gather in the middle of the room. This time the actors were the Red Queen, Mad Hatter, and Alice. Nancy studied the room and once most of the guests were laughing, she and Bess ducked under the table. It is now or never. There is a window that we can escape out of that opens onto the back alley. Nancy explained. They crept along and Lucky did make it to the window unnoticed by the staff. Bess tried to open the window but it was painted shut. Nancy pondered for a moment before going to hide under a large table with a long cloth draped over it and waited until a waitress came near. Then she pulled the rug out from underneath the waitress. Nancy and Bess made a run for it as the other staff was checking on the fallen girl. Once outside, the two ran over to a department store to hide. Thank God, Nancy. That was a close one. Bess said as they walked to the front of the store. Yeah but I feel bad for having to trip that girl up like that. She could have been really hurt. Nancy admitted. Bess did not respond to her friend and looked away in the distance, as if in thought. The two girls waited inside the door until their ride came. Chapter 15 The cab pulled up slowly and waited at the curb. Once inside, they instructed the driver to take them to the local college so Nancy can meet with the professor. The ride to the school took up a half an hour of their time. As they pulled up to the university, they were taken back at the sight of it. Are you sure this is the place? Bess asked the driver. Yes, it is, replied the man, as he held out his hand for the money. Nancy counted it back to him carefully. Then she asked as the driver started to pull away, what about my change? Tips are not included in the fare anymore miss, replied the man. He took off with an extra five bucks. Nancy exclaimed. In response, Bess put her hand on Nancy's arm, as if to say it is not worth the trouble. Nancy sighed and turned around towards the university. It was no wonder the two girls were confused when they first pulled up. This place looked more like a castle than a college. It was a huge stone building with steeples and many stained glass windows. Where are we heading? Bess asked as they both started walking up to the building. Not really sure right now. I did not really think to get a room number when I called. But they did say something about the language department. Perhaps they will have some kind of map inside for us. Bess hoped before pushing open the heavy wooden door to go inside. The girls were taken aback by the twenty-foot high ceiling, ornate tile flooring, and a grand spiral staircase in the middle of the room. Bess sat down beside Nancy on a long iron bench along one of the walls. We are just going to have to ask someone to show us where it is, Bess suggested. That was when she noticed a young skinny man with slicked back, brown hair and thick-rimmed glasses. He was reading a flyer on one of the walls. Excuse me, I need some help to please, Bess called out as she approached him. The young man did not respond. Bess walked closer to him and cleared her throat. He looked up at her and nearly jumped out of his skin. I am sorry. I did not mean to scare you. Bess said as she flashed him a cute smile. I am looking for the language department. Can you help? she asked sweetly. He swallowed hard and looked like a deer in headlights for a moment. He trembled and stammered before asking, Are you talking to me? To their surprise when Bess nodded yes, the young man looked at if he was panicked. Nancy walked up and put a hand on her friend's shoulder. She motioned for them to try someone else. In an effort to save time, the girls split up. 
Bess headed to the right and as walking thought a frosted glass door when she literally ran into someone. Who do you think you are, nearly knocking me over like? She stopped short after seeing who it was, she was talking to. Standing there was Chase, I am so sorry. I was not paying attention and ran right into you, he struggled to explain. That is all right, no real harm done, Bess said. Excuse me, but can you two love birds flirt later? I have to get to the languages department before it closes. Nancy said waving her hand between the two other teens' faces. Chase cleared his throat and blushed deeper. I can show you the way it is on the second floor. Just follow me and try not to get lost in the crowd. Chapter 16 They went up the spiral stairs and then down a long hall, after a few more twists and turns the teens were standing outside the office. Nancy ran up just as a man was locking the office door behind him. Excuse me, I'm looking for Mr. Wright, Nancy explained. In response, the man took a long look at Nancy. Before answering, well, that is me. Are you a student here, if so how may I help you? Nancy looked surprised for a moment, before replying, my name is Nancy Drew. I believe we have spoken on over the phone before. I need some help translating on symbols on an old family heirloom. Come to think of it, I do remember us speaking. Please come inside, so that I can examine the item in question, he said while unlocking the door. Once inside the office, Nancy presented the watch to the professor. Hum. This is quite an unusual piece. May I ask, where you got it? he asked. It was my grandfather's, however, none of my living relatives seemed to know much about it. I accidentally dropped it and found the inscription hidden inside. Nancy explained but changed most of the story. The last thing she wanted was for the wrong person to learn where she found the watch and commandeer it. She had heard of museums and governments claiming rights to items found on shipwrecks and did not want to press her luck. The professor did not respond, instead, he opened the watch to study the writing with a powerful magnifying glass. After a moment of silence, he spoke. I believe this to be Celtic writing. It translates to the word, Aquarius. Nancy's eyes lit up. She felt that this was a legit link to the local legend of the mermaid. The professor was still studying the watch when a look of shock come upon his face. Is there something wrong? Nancy asked. It is nothing to worry about, said the man. After taking the watch back the teens left, however, Nancy could not shake the feeling of being watched. Once outside, Chase happily agreed to drive them back to the inn. Nancy felt like he would probably do anything to spend more time with Bess. Chase, I met someone the other day that could have been your doppelganger, said Nancy as they claimed into his car. That is really strange. What exactly did he look like? Chase asked with a concerned look. Well, he looked almost exactly like you in the face, however, he has brown hair. Chase seemed to become agitated he listened. Are you guys related somehow? Nancy asked. Well, perhaps now is not the best time to get into this. Chase replied. Nancy eyed him for a moment but decided not to push the topic. Chase dropped the girls off outside the inn. I can't wait to take a long hot bath, said Bess as they walked the porch steps. That sounds like a good idea, Nancy added. Just when Nancy was reaching for the door handle, Carter burst through the door, with his suitcase in hand. Cater, where you going? Is something wrong? asked Bess. Carter turned to look at Bess with anger burning in his eyes. Then he looked away and yelled, I will not just sit back and be cheated on. Bess looked shocked as she watched Carter hail a taxi. Then she ran over to him, hoping to change his mind. Carter, please wait I would never what on you. In response, he glanced at her once more before taking off in the taxi. Bess tried to chase after it but had to stop once it drove out of sight. Bess was sobbing as Nancy helped her up the stairs to their room. 
Once there, Bess laid down on her bed, and then pulled the covers over her head. Nancy slowly closed the door, then sat down next to her friend. Bess do you need to vent? Nancy cooed while she lightly rubbed Bess's trembling back. I cannot believe he thinks I cheated on him. Sure, I flirt a lot, but I never actually act on that. If he really cares about you, he will give you a chance to explain yourself in the future, said Nancy. In response, Bess sat up and dried her eyes, do you really think so? Nancy chuckled, of course I do, you silly. Bess smiled and leaned forward to hug her best friend, what are our plans for the rest of the night? Well, dinner should be ready soon, after that maybe we find a movie to watch on TV or have a spa night. That sounds like a great plan. Any ideas about what we can do tomorrow? Nancy sat there in thought for a moment before replying, let me call Chase and ask if we can hang out with him in the AM. Bess blushed as she replied, that sounds like fun. Chapter 17 Bright and early, the next day Chase picked the girls in his jeep. Nancy sat in the back seat going over what the professor had told them yesterday. That word Aquarius, where have I heard that before? Nancy pondered. Bess giggled, I am shocked that the famous girl detective does not get it. The answer is so simple. Nancy wore a sour expression as she replied, please do enlighten me. It has something to do with horoscopes and the constellations, Chase added. Bess smiled as she said, that is right. If I am remembering correctly, that sign is linked to the water. Most people born in late January and early February are connected to the sign. She shook her head, regrettably, I do not know anything about the personality that is said to go along with the sign. Nancy carefully took the antique watch for her purse and looked it over once again. She figured that since it was a water sign it would have a matching symbol that was also aquatic. She inspected the watch carefully and noticed that a small mermaid design was engraved on it. She tried to press on the engraving but to no avail. The trio quickly turned into a special curbside dinner to get something for lunch. In a moment a teenage girl came up to them wearing a pair of roller skates. What would you like to order, she asked while pulling out a notepad and pen from her apron pocket. I will have your special heart attack burger, small fry, and a large Pepsi, said Chase. I would like a large strawberry milkshake, Bess added. Nancy took her time reading the menu before ordering a BLT sandwich and a small Sprite. Not long after the waitress returned carrying a tray full of their food. You have some skills to do all this on skates, commented Chase. In response, the waitress smiled. Would you anything else? If not I'll total up the bill. This is plenty, said Chase as he handed her some cash. Thanks, I will be right back with the change. As they were eating, Nancy had a thought. Guys did not notice something kind of. Nancy paused for a moment as she mulled over what she wanted to say. Then she added, off about the professor. He seemed all right to me. Well, maybe just a little moody. But who is not after a long day at work? Chase answered in between bites of his greasy fast food. What do you mean Nancy? Bess asked. Nancy stretched out her arms and yawned deeply. Something just felt wrong with the way he had his eyes glued to us when we left. I felt like we were being watched by some creepy stalker. I think Mr. Wright an okay guy, he is just passionate about history. I have taken one of his classes before. Sure, he might seem a little off to most people, but he is harmless. Chase explained. His advice really did not help Nancy feel any better. Nancy had seen something wrong in the professor's eyes and intended to stay far away from him. Suddenly Bess turned around in her seat and grabbed Nancy's hand, yeah, Nancy it is okay Chase knows what he is talking about. We need to try to make the best of this trip. Nancy did not respond and averted her gaze from Bess. Chase cranked up the jeep causing the motor to purr and vibrate. Babes, where to now? 
We have a few hours until sunset, he grinned at Bess hoping for an entertaining response. Well, since you are the local, we will let you decide, said Bess. All right, girls but you might not be able to keep up. Good thing it will be a warm night out, he chuckled. Bess and Nancy looked at each other and gulped. Why did he have in mind? They drove deeper and deeper into the wilds and soon Nancy could taste the salt in the air. So, they were near the coast. The road became bumpy and ragged before turning on to nothing more than a narrow dirt path. Chase had to slow down a bit to compensate for the rough road. Nancy looked around this area was a dense woodland with lots of ivy and greenery all around them everywhere. Bird calls could be heard overhead, and a wild sea hawk flew overhead in search of an easy meal. Chapter 18 The trio pulled over into a clearing surrounded by tall trees. Looks like we're out in the middle of nowhere. Where are we? Bess asked. Oh, come on don't be like that babe. You will love this, it is just a little farther on foot to the cove. Chase coaxed trying to get Bess to lighten up a bit. He opened the jeep door and held out his hand for Bess. She paused for a moment in thought before reluctantly taking his hand in hers. After grabbing some towels from the trunk, the group started down a small path through the woods. Nancy walked behind them and noticed a new sound barely audible over all the bird songs around them. What was it? It sounded like running water. A river perhaps with some small streams? Suddenly, Chase let go of Bess and darted ahead of them. Ladies welcome to paradise, he announced standing with his arm outstretched to his sides. Behind him secluded area with a small waterfall with a clear pool of water below it. Bess squealed with glee, this is amazing. Nancy took in her surroundings before adding, this place is really something. How did you discover this gem in a remote area in the first place? Chase grinned and sat down on a nearby boulder. This area is a family secret that has passed down for many generations. Bess looked up at him as she asked, why would you want to keep this secret? To keep this secret for so long this place shady and contain many dead bodies. Nancy said sarcastically as she wiggled her eyebrows for comedic effect. Chase wore a shocked expression as he exclaimed, How did you know? Then he fell to the ground laughing so hard he had to hold his stomach. In response, Nancy just rolled her eyes and went behind some trees to undress. She was so thankful that she and Bess had decided to wear some bikinis under their clothing just in case they wanted a dip in the ocean. When she returned, Nancy was surprised to find Bess stripping down to her bathing suit, while Chase watched with a dopey look on his face. As Bess and Chase raced into the chilly water to swim, Nancy chose to tan instead. She quickly found a sunny spot and then laid down there on top of a towel. What good is a vacation if you do not come back with a tan, she mused. Not long after, Bess and Chase had claimed to the very top of the waterfall. Nancy heard Bess scream when Chase pulled Bess over the waterfall with him. When the two hit the water it created a huge splash that drenched Nancy where she lay. I told you that would be fun, said Chase. It was a little, but I am far too frightened to ever do that again. Bess replied. Chase went under the water and playfully tried to pull Bess under. Chase stop it. Stop acting like an immature little brother. Bess argued as she kicked him away. Chase came up and pushed his wet hair back. Then he gave Bess a quick kiss on the cheek. Since she was soaked anyway Nancy dove into the clear waters. It felt amazing as she floated on her back. Out of curiosity, she decided to dive down to the bottom of the pool to see what she could find living down there. She found some small freshwater fish that looked to be guarding broods of their eggs. Then something reflective caught Nancy's attention. At the bottom under some pebbles, she found what looked like a large pendant, in the shape of a raindrop, with a swirly pattern carved onto it. Upon resurfacing, Nancy also found that the jewel to be an odd color that seemed to shift between yellow and purple. 
How strange to find something like this out in the middle of nowhere, she commented. Nancy, do you want to go boat riding? Bess asked as she walked up. Nancy looked startled for a second being adding, sure, that sounds like fun. Author's note asterisk. When writing this chapter one tried to envision the perfect secluded vacation spot. Chapter 19 By the time they reached the pier, it had gotten dark. Ryan quickly jumped aboard the speedboat and held out his hand to help the girls get in. Then he untied the boat and pushed off from the pier with his foot. The engine roared to life driving the boat speeding off into the distance. Once they reached the middle of the cove, Chase cut the engine. Here the waters were calm and the breeze was light. The constellations could be seen reflected on the surface of the water. They rested here monetarily. The reflections off all the lights seemed to dance as Nancy dipped her small hand into the water. All of a sudden, a loud bang rang out over the cove. What was that? asked Bess. That sounded like a gunshot. Nancy exclaimed. That is not good, said Chase. Are they shooting at us? asked Nancy as she peered out over the waters. No, it was from far away. I think it came from the other side of the cove, added Chase. Bess hid behind Chase and asked, what if someone is badly hurt? Chase sighed deeply, I guess the right thing to do would be to find out where that shot came from and call the police for help. That sounds dangerous, commented Bess. I have to pull you, two girls, into this. Trust me I will not let anyone hurt you. Chase said reassuringly as he put his around Bess. Nancy nodded and replied, let's go find out before I come to my senses and change my mind. They pointed the boat in the direction of the gunshot and took off, but at a much slower speed than usual. There were two more gunshots that lead them to a large white home in the bank. There it is. I wonder what is going on in that house, commented Nancy. Bess had been quiet for a long time before adding, now that we know where the trouble is, let's get to safety ourselves. She was shocked when Chase brought the boat close to shore. Are you trying to get up killed here? You are supposed to be running away from gunshots. She whined. Bess what if someone is hurt, he tried to explain. What if you get hurt, she quipped. He smirked, don't worry doll, I was born lucky. Unexpectedly, his expression quickly changed to concern, this area is rural so I do not think we are going to be able to find a phone to use anywhere close by. I need you, girls, to stay here and be quiet while I try to go help, he ordered before sinking down into the chest deep waters. They watched as he slowly crept up to the shoreline, eventually making his way into the yard. Bess sat on the side of the boat, wrapped up in one of the towels from earlier. She mumbled under her breath while rocking back and forth. I do not like this at all. This is terrifying for me. Nancy did not respond, ran her fingers through her hair, and became lost in thought. A moment later, the sound of another gunshot could be heard, spooking the girls. Bess cried and clung to Nancy. Bess, I need you to be strong. How do you expect me to be strong? I wish there was some way to help. There is, but it is risky. I need you to take the boat and travel in clockwise order until you can find a house with lights on. To go ask for help. Earlier you were piloting the boat with Chase, so I know you can do it. Nancy explained as she lightly shook Bess. Are you coming with me? Nancy said nothing as she lowered herself into the water. No Nancy stay here. It is safer here. Bess tried to tell her. Nancy just shook her head and kept going in the same direction Chase had originally taken towards the house. Chapter 20 As Nancy neared the home, she noticed a car that was half hidden behind a few lush bushes. From where she stood, no one looked to be inside the vehicle. She decided to take a peek inside to find that one of the windows had been broken. That does not look good she whispered. 
Next, she checked the car doors and found that the front passenger door was left unlocked. When Nancy pulled open the door, the smell of sour-smelling garbage turned her stomach. Oh lord, what slobs! This is just so disgusting, she commented while looking through the car. All she found at first was fast food bags and empty candy wrappers. Then she opened the glove compartment. Oh my god there is a gun in here, she exclaimed. Hopefully, no one heard her. She checked the gun's chamber to find two bullets left there. For protection, Nancy decided to hold on to the gun by turning on the safety, tucking it behind her belt, and letting her shirt drape over it. The teen felt so thankful that her father had insisted she learn how to one a few years prior. Before moving on, she pulled out a small notebook and pencil from her purse. Then she scribbled down the license plate number. Better to be safe than sorry, she mused. Nancy took her time moving closer to the house. With a clear view of the back door, the girl noticed a man sitting on the back steps. He was smoking a think cigar, occasionally sending smoke rings into the night air. Nancy wondered if this man was acting as a lookout for others. She looked to the door, searching for a sign that Chase had made it inside. All of a sudden, she heard the bushes rustle behind her. Before Nancy could turn around to see what was happening, a hand was put over her mouth. Then she was pulled behind one of the bushes. In retaliation, she bit the hand that covered her mouth. Almost instantly, the attacker let go allowing her to escape. She got to her feet only to almost die of laughter. There on the ground was Chase crying as he held his hand. Where are you, Nancy Drew? I am sure there is some bulldog mixed into your family tree. She smirked, yeah well you deserve it, scaring me like that. Chase sat up, the front door is locked and the back is guarded. Let's try the windows on the dark side of the house to see if we can get in, suggested Nancy. Chase nodded in agreement. Once there, they checked the windows only to discover that they were all locked. Nancy sighed and hung her head. When she looked up, however, Chase was pointing at a smaller window that had gone unnoticed until now. This one looked much older than the others and had a keyhole on it. This gave Nancy an idea. She pulled a small bobby pin from her locks before beginning to try to pick the lock. Chase elbowed her gently, do I really want to know how you obtained this questionable skill? Nancy smirked back at him, probably not. Chase shot her a funny look before shaking his head in frustration. Before he knew it the window was unlocked. He pulled out his small pocket knife to help open the window. After making sure no one was nearby inside of the house, they stabbed the knife into the wood to act as a handle. Nancy was the first inside, followed by Chase. They found themselves in a dark dining room. There was stuff dumped all over the room. It had obviously been ransacked. They searched the space and found a large suitcase sitting on the floor. Nancy unlatched it to find a pile of old books and maps inside. What was going on here? Who would want this old junk? They could hear someone else in the house, so the teens peeked into the next room. There they discovered a short round man dressed in a dark coat. He was putting more books into a duffel bag. Why steal a bunch of old dusty books? Were they first editions and thus worth a lot of money? From overhead footsteps were audible. It was hard to tell how many people were up there. The two crept up the stairs to investigate. Once at the top of the stairs, Carter and Nancy could see the shadows of two men elongated on the right wall. It has to be around here somewhere. What did the boss say it looked like Joe, said of the men in a raspy voice. He did not. The boss just said to go get the captain's Brooks old map. It could be in a book, picture frame, or hidden anywhere, replied the other in a deep low voice. James needs to be here. He is the only one that knows anything about this stuff. We might just have to take everything with us to sort out later, said the first man. I'm just glad the blacks are gone off for the season. 
The last thing we need is captives right now. Nancy pulled Chase close and whispered into his ear, since there is no one being held here, I think we are better off hiding until these guys leave. Are you sure? I think we should call the police. Chase tried to argue in a hushed tone. Nancy shook her head no, I am afraid they would hear us on the phone. Come on, let's hide in one of the closets. They made their way back down the stair as noiselessly as possible. To their dismay, Chase stepped on a loose step, causing a loud, creak, to sound. They looked to each other, as they held their breath. After a long pause, they signed in relief when no appeared to investigate. Then they made their way down the rest of the stairs to soon discover what looked like a little girl's room. Figuring this would the last place anyone would look for a map they decided to hide in here. They opened the closet door, went inside, hid behind the child's clothing, and waited. They had a man with a raspy voice call out, I think this is it in this old dusty journal. Better take that and the other two books just in case, replied another man with a deep voice. Ace, come on it is time to go, yelled the raspy-voiced man. Chase and Nancy waited until they heard the sound of the car pulling away, to peek outside the closet. Then they carefully searched the house before calling the police. Upon their return, the teens found Bess asleep in the boat. Nancy shook her friend awake, as Chase eased the boat away from the shallows. Chapter 21 the next morning Nancy awoke to the sound of a loud scream. Jeff kill it. It is under the couch, yelled a woman. IT ran upstairs, yelled a man, as a little gray rat ran up the stairway and into Nancy's room. It saw Bess sleeping and hid under the covers to be safe. A few minutes later, the door flew open. Nancy sat up but Bess was still asleep. Have you seen a rat? asked the innkeeper. In response, Nancy shook her head no. Bess awoke with she felt something moving under her covers and screamed wildly. Without thinking, Bess threw the covers to the floor. They all watched as the creature wriggled free from the fabric. The innkeeper held the broom just over the rat before slamming it down. Somehow the rat just missed being crushed, only to scurry out of the bedroom and dash down the hall. My apologies miss, muttered the innkeeper, before stepping out to resume the chase. Nancy laughed whole-heatedly, while Bess pouted on the other side of the room. Oh gee, now I have to shower again, commented Bess as she wore a sour expression. Do not let this ruin your day. There is far too much to see and do, to let that happen, said Nancy. Easy for you to say, replied Bess from the bathroom. Moments later, they were both dressed in pastel-colored sundresses that were trimmed with lace. Can't forget these, said Bess while handed Nancy a pair of black cat-eye sunglasses. Nancy smiled, a very good idea indeed, thank you. Then the two girls went downstairs to eat breakfast. Once they entered the kitchen the innkeeper's wife spoke to Nancy, you had quite a few calls yesterday. She handed Nancy a sheet of paper with the messages she had received. Your father called and left a message. A professor also rang a few times, insisting you call him back as soon as possible. I do believe, he wants to buy a watch from you. Nancy narrowed her brows, thank you, I will be sure to call them back as soon as possible. Then she pulled out a chair to have a seat at the kitchen table, where a large pile of pancakes awaited her. An hour later, Chase showed up to take them for another scuba diving lesson. Today the waters were choppy on the surface, however, Chase assured them that under the water it would be much calmer. This time he took them way farther out than they had gone before. After, throwing the anchor overboard, and putting on the diving equipment, they jumped off the boat into the chilly waters. Under the surface of the water, this area of the cove was vast and mostly empty. Damn it, I went too far north. Looks like we have to will swim a bit to the target location. Chase admitted. Where is it we are headed to? Bess asked. The underwater castle ruins. He answered before leading them towards the kelp forest. 
This time they stayed together as a group, so no one got lost. As they traveled, the teens came across what looked like a large pile of rocks with lots of tiny fish darting all around. They watched the sea life for a while, until a small reef shark appeared, which caused all of the smaller fish to take shelter. After continuing on for about 15 minutes, dark shadow engulfed them. Nancy's blood ran cold when she saw the outline of a huge shark pass overhead. It was massive, with dark gray skin with white spots all over it. The monster swam around in circles as if surveying the seascape. Nancy panicked as it opened its huge three-foot-wide mouth and headed right for her. She tried to swim away only to discover the shark swimming calmly beside her a moment later. Chase had swum up to the shark and ran his hand along the creature's side. Do not worry girls, it is just a whale shark, a filter feeder that cannot bite you if it wanted to. Nancy felt a little embarrassed but swam closer to get a better look. She pulled out her underwater camera and got some amazing pictures. She knew that without these pictures, no one back home would ever believe that something this amazing actually happened. While Nancy was looking through the viewfinder of the camera she noticed something strange in the background. To her surprise, it looked to be a statue of a woman. As she swam closer, a tail on the statue came into view. A mermaid statue, how fitting to find underwater, thought Nancy. The mermaid's hair appeared to move in the water and she held her hand was outstretched as if reaching for something or someone. Wow, this is exciting! Nancy exclaimed. After taking a few fun photos, she turned her attention to the base of the statue. There seemed to be something written here. Gently she wiped the sand away from the base. Nancy was left breathless when she found the words, Aquarius, and, Hidden Moonlit Glen, carved into the stone. That sounded like where they were yesterday with the waterfall. What was going on here? Chapter 22 Nancy followed the compass to a small pile of rubble. She felt confused and wondered if something could be hidden underneath the stone. I need some help. I may have found something notable, she said over the radio. Not long after Chase and Bess arrived at the scene. Nancy explained her theory to them. Only for Chase to reply, Nancy, I really think this is a waste of time. Bess smiled up at him warmly, give Nancy a chance. Believe it or not, she has a nose for sniffing out mysteries. He sighed before adding, well if you insist, it is your money down the drain. Once they began to work together to clear the rubble, it did not take long to unearth a covered well. When they removed the thin stone lid from the top of the well, the inside was found to be intact and clear of debris. Nancy grinned like a sly cat, and you said this would be a waste of time. Chase ignored her prodding, I wonder what is down there. Bess made a funny face as she asked, do you think it is full of dead fish? In response, Nancy and Chase burst out laughing. Nancy put her hand con Bess's shoulder. Somehow I really doubt that Bess. If I had to guess there might be some broken pottery or other artifacts. Chase looked at them both in the eyes before adding, I'm pretty sure Timmy's bones are down there. You know Lassie never did go find help. The girls giggled at the joke. That was a good one, said Bess. Nancy sat down on the edge of the well to peer down it. There is only one way to find out. Chase grabbed her arm firmly, you cannot be serious. Nancy shot him a dirty look before shaking free from his grip. I will be okay. No need to worry. Chase started to argue before Bess cut in, it is no use arguing with her. Nancy has a mind of her own with a strong will to match. He frowned at the girls, before pulling a glow stick free from his diving belt. Take this with you. We use these was as a light source when diving in underwater caves. With the glow stick held tightly in her hand, Nancy slowly descended into the darkness. She watched as the light overhead disappeared behind the veil of darkness. Moments passed as her friends waited for Nancy's return. I sure hope she is alright, said Bess. 
If she is not back up soon, I will go in after her. I just wish Nancy's radio was working. I'm guessing that the stone must be blocking the signal. Chase explained. Then both sighed deeply feeling discouraged. The best took his hand in hers, pulled him closer, before staring up into his beautiful eyes. Just then, without being noticed Nancy popped up out of the well. When she saw what her friends were up to, a childish smile crept upon her face. She got up close behind them and said loudly into the radio, Sue, what are you doing? Sure hope I am not interrupting anything important. The two love birds jumped in surprise, Nancy when did you get back up here? Chase managed to squeak. Oh, believe me, I saw everything, Nancy said with a laugh. In response, Bess glared at Nancy. I found a door hidden at the very bottom that we just have to check out, Nancy explained. Nancy we only have one hour of air left and it will take twenty minutes at least just to get back to the boat. I think we should stay up here. Chase said, trying to reason with her. Oh come on, this could be our only chance to explore this area. Just think of what could be down there. This is the discovery of a lifetime in the waiting. Nancy argued. Nancy use your head there could be a cave in and you could get trapped in there. He yelled. Nancy bit her lip. If I am not back in twenty minutes, come to look for me. Nancy said before going diving back down into the darkness of the well. Bess went to follow Nancy but Chase grabbed her arm to hold her back. I will not let Nancy do this on her own. Chase wait up here just in case we need help. Have faith in us, sweetie. Bess said with a wink just before twisting from his firm grasp. Meanwhile, down at the bottom in the well, Nancy had pulled open the door and ventured into an underground tunnel. The teen paused when she heard a strange sound. Was that a whale song? she wondered. Just then something reached out and grabbed her arm, making her jump. Fearing for the worst she slowly began to turn around, to find Bess floating behind her. Calm down Nancy, it is just me. Chase is waiting topside for us. Bess said as she pointed upwards. Nancy let out a relieved sigh, before continuing to venture deeper into the tunnel. They found it to be a long, dark, and eerie passage. Surprisingly, they found what appeared to be remnants of torches that still clung to the grey stone walls. This might have been an escape route used by townspeople long ago. I vaguely remember hearing about them in history class. Nancy explained. Once near the end of the passage, some light could be seen coming in from an outside source. Upon coming closer, the girls found a large metal door that was partway open just enough to let them squeeze through. On the other side, filtered sunlight greeted them through narrow windows cut into the tall stone walls. They found the floors to be covered in a layer of sand, however, in places, stone tile in rich hues of blue could be seen peeking through. After a short while, nothing was found at the bottom of the tower, except for some rotting wood. So they explored near the top to find two open passageways. First, they explored the passage on the right, to find that it was a dimly lit corridor. Not much was over in this area except for some old creates that were piled high. Nancy opened one out of curiosity to find a few cannonballs inside and a rusted sword. Next, they went to explore the other path. This one was brightly lit with a few small stained glass windows still intact along its walls. It was a long hallway with many doors leading elsewhere. They peeked in one door, it appeared to be the kitchen. Rusted pots and knives still hung from the walls. The last door led to a hall of windows, the girls found that most were cracked or blocked on the outside. As they swam Nancy noticed a strange shadow move quickly on the other side of the windows. What was that? she asked. What is it, Nancy? No worries, I am sure it was nothing. They found a huge wooden door with a lever beside it. Nancy pulled on it to open the door. Come on Bess, let's go have a look. Nancy something just does not feel right about this. 
I think we need to go back to the boat. Bess said hoping Nancy would listen to reason. To her surprise, Nancy declined to answer and entered the room anyway. Bess stood her ground, refusing to join her friend. Instead, she watched the colorful little fish that swam about. Inside was a large room that was filled with old paintings and the remains of what used to a vast library. At the very back of the room was a huge wooden cabinet, the years had not been kind to it but it still somehow stood. After looking through the drawers of the cabinet, Nancy turned to leave, only to realize the door was locked tight. Bess, please pull the lever and me out. Nancy demanded while pounding on the doorway. Bess tried desperately to free her friend, however, the lever would not budge. It is stuck tight. I'll go get Chase, maybe he can help. After Bess went left to go find help, Nancy tried to find a way out by searching the room. She found a mechanism that opened a door into a hidden room filled with what was once expensive furnishings. I guess this was a hidden treasure room at some time. It looks like it was cleaned out years ago. Moments later, Chase arrived but could not find a way to save Nancy. He urged Bess to swim for the surface because they did not have much air left in their tanks. Chapter 23 Nancy's air supply was drastically depleted to the point where her head felt dizzy and her vision blurred. She struggled to keep her eyes open. Just then there was a strange sound. It reminded her of a whale song mixed with human-like vocals. It sounded like the song was calling out to her, follow the spinning arrow. Let it point the way to where your destiny lay. As Nancy was on the verge of blacking out, a strange shadow appeared in her field of vision. It began to slowly move closer just as she lost consciousness. Back on the boat, Bess was in tears, while Chase was on the ham radio calling for help. After ten minutes waiting without a response, Chase started the engine and headed back to land. He was sure Nancy was dead, however, he still felt the need to try to save her. The water was choppy as they made their way back, causing both of them to feel sick to their stomachs. Despite this fact, they carried on. Thankfully, in the span of thirty minutes the shoreline was in sight. Chase slowed the engine as they neared the boat deck. That was when Bess noticed something strange laying half-summered in the water. Bess jumped up onto the wooden deck. Then edged herself closer to get a better look. Oh my god, it is Nancy, she exclaimed. Bess raced to Nancy, who lay on the sand with only her upper torso out of the water. Interestingly enough, most of her diving gear including the scuba mask was missing. Even more puzzling was the strange spiral-like marks surrounded her in the sand. Bess held Nancy in her arms as Chase kneeled down to check for a pulse. To his surprise, there was a very faint heartbeat. Without hesitation, he carefully lifted Nancy up off the ground to carry her to the jeep. Bess opened the passenger side door before moving out of the way. As Chase was laying Nancy across the back seat, Bess noticed something fall to the car floor. She picked the object up to find that it was a compass. How strange, she commented. Once they were all loaded up in the car, they took off like a bat out of hell for the nearest hospital. A few hours later, Nancy was headed back to the inn with strict orders to rest. I am so glad you are okay, Nancy. I thought you were dead when we found you. Bess explained. Nancy smiled weakly. Sorry to have worried you. Chase cleared his throat, do you have any idea how you ended up on the beach? I am afraid not. I remember being trapped and panicking. When my air supply got too low I blacked out, answered Nancy. Bess turned round in her seat to look at Nancy, perhaps it was an angel that saved you. Or an evil sea witch, who saved you only to claim your body for her own. Chase teased. Bess stuck her tongue out at him, you are so silly. Once they had arrived back at the inn they were greeted at the door by the owners, who wore worried expressions. We were only gone for an hour, only to return to find the place had been broken into. 
your room appears to have been the only one to be ransacked. We are not sure what was taken to call the police. Nancy and Bess looked at each other and gulped. As fast as they could, the teens dashed up to their room to investigate. They found that some of their jewelry was taken but also the antique pocket watch. Nancy wondered if this could be the work of the gang she had read about earlier. They spent an hour filling out a report with the police before grabbing something to eat for dinner. The innkeepers were kind enough to offer for the girls another room to sleep in until they could clean up their original room. Surprisingly, they even offered Chase a place to sleep for the night. Bess looked through a magazine as Nancy rested in bed. The day's advents filled Nancy's mind like a wild windstorm. The girl's thoughts finally settled on the song she heard in the underwater castle before drifting into a peaceful slumber. Later on that night, the sound of rain pounding on the slate roof woke Nancy from her relaxing sleep. It must be raining cats and dogs out there, she grumbled. Nancy turned back over to try to get some more sleep. This did not last long, however, she was reawakened by the sound of metal scraping. It sounded like it was coming from down the hall. This better not end up being something stupid, she whispered. Reluctantly she sat up and swung her feet over the side of the bed. Her body felt so heavy and drained. She slipped out of the room, then down the quiet hall. In her hand, Nancy held a metal flashlight to light the way. Once Nancy had reached the door to her original room, she was shocked to find wet boot prints leading into it. What is going on here? She wondered. Then she realized the door was slightly agar. Peering through the opening she could make out the figure of a person. With the element of surprise on her side, she crept forward with the flashlight held high in the air. Nancy held her breath, got behind the intruder, and hit them hard on the head. The thief crumbled down on the floor like a broken china doll as Nancy yelled for help. Moments later, the others came running to find Nancy standing over the body of a young boy. In the child's hand was a handkerchief with the letters J.S. embroidered in gold on it. Chapter 24 The police arrived at the scene when a short man with thick-rimmed glasses walked into the room. We have a report on young women attacking a little boy. I am looking for a Nancy Drew, he said very plainly. There has been a mistake Nancy would never attack a child. Bess cried out. Where is Nancy? The police questioned once again. I am the owner of this inn. Please let me explain how this has all been a huge misunderstanding. Care to have a seat, said the man as he sat down on the sofa. The officer frowned as he sat down. You see, this place was broken into earlier today, said the innkeeper before explaining the rest in fine detail. After taking down the owner's testimony, the officer moved on to question the rest of the group. After all the questioning was finished, the officer turned to Nancy then said in a very aggravated tone, You are lucky to have such good friends here to stand up for you. Otherwise, I would have you in a cell by now. You should never put yourself in such a situation again where harming a child is the outcome. Then he turned to leave and returned to his patrols. What a hard ass. Even after all that explaining, he still assumes the worst. Bess complained. Chase shook his head, unfortunately, some people are like that. They make up their minds, only to refuse to change their opinions no matter what evidence is given. I am too tired to do any more thinking. Let us just get to bed. I want to sleep in tomorrow. Nancy explained as she led the way back upstairs. The next morning around 10 a.m., the girls were awakened by the wonderful aroma smell of bacon being cooked. They got changed before rushing down the stairs feeling half-starved. They were greeted by Chase as they walked into the kitchen. He held a newspaper in his hands as he sipped on some steaming coffee. Nancy take a look at this paper from yesterday, he urged while heading over the newspaper. Nancy was shocked to see the cover article that read, Third Eye Gang Hit a Lawyer's House at the Lake. Last night a caller claiming to be a nearby neighbor reported an intruder in the vacant summer estate. 
The house had been ransacked with princeless maps and rare first edition books stolen. The police believed there had been a shootout at this location because they found many bullet holes scattered throughout the property. This is surprising, she commented. Read the last page, it has more information on the case, Chase instructed. The last page read, Mr. James was very upset to find that a one-of-a-kind book about Blackbeard was among the stolen items. It was said to hold many legends of the pirate, perhaps even gives the location of his long-lost treasure. Nancy was not quite sure what to make of this. But this does prove that it all has something to do with the treasure she is trying to find. Chase leaned back in his chair and stared blankly at the ceiling. I have to admit something does bother me from that article. The part about the information that might lead to the lost treasure has to be a lie. I feel like if it was true someone would have used that book to find the treasure long ago. It would be too tempting for most people not to chase after it. Nancy was lost in thought for a moment as she composed her response, you are probably right. I reckon that was just added in for a bit of fun or perhaps just to help sell newspapers. Nancy, can I take a look at that? Bess asked as she pointed to the newspaper. As requested, Nancy quickly passed it to Bess, before exiting the room to make some phone calls. The first phone call she made was to her home. The phone rang a few times before being answered by the housekeeper, this is the Drew residence. For whom are you calling? Hannah, I am glad to hear your voice. How are things on the home front? Nancy, I am glad you called. Your father and I were just talking about you. Would you like to talk to your father? Yeah, if he is there please put him on. Here he is, sweetie. Well if it isn't my little twinkle toes, how is the trip? I sure hope you have not been getting into any trouble again. Oh, dad I would not call it trouble really exactly. He chucked, I take it you have stumbled upon a new case. Are you at liberty to explain? Well dad you see it is pretty complicated. Nancy fumbled with her words unsure of what was safe to share in such a pubic location. I am sorry, it is not the best time to dive into all that. I understand sweetie. Just remember, intelligence is what sets us apart for the animal kingdom. So make sure to use your brains. Nancy paced a few steps, I will do that dad. Thanks for the advice. So how has the trip been so far? Rob any banks yet? Nancy laughed in response, it has been pretty swell so far. We have been sightseeing, to the beach, and scuba diving. I am glad you are enjoying it. Before you go I need to tell you that Ned came by last night. Apparently Hannah gave him the phone number to the inn. Thanks for letting me know. Love you both. Same here twinkle toes, he replied before hanging up the phone. Nancy sighed as she looked down at her feet where the receiver's cord had gotten tangled up. After freeing herself, she plopped down on a nearby armchair. I think it would be a good idea to check in on George, she commented while dialing the number. Unfortunately, no one answered the line. Feeling bored, she headed back to the kitchen. Once there she noticed that Chase was gone. Did Chase leave? she asked Bess. Bess looked up from her pile of pancakes, he had to go back to the surf shop. He said something about having to check some new diving gear that just came in. After eating the girls went up to their original room to clean up the mess. It took them quite a while to get all the clothing sorted and folded back up neatly in their luggage. The two girls took their time deciding what to wear. Bess choose a pale blue baby doll style top with some white knee pants and strappy heels. She chose a small white clutch and lace hairband to finch the look. Nancy, on the other hand, tried on a few items. Bess ended up helping her decide on a white tank, black converses, and a pair of stylish gray jeans. She chose a silver-colored over-the-shoulder bag to use for the day. Now let's go out on the town and break some hearts. Bess declared as they ran out the door. Chapter 25
The first shop they went to was really tween-like with its wall full of cute purses, glitter accessories, and plastic jewelry. On the aisles, there were knock-off perfumes, inexpensive lips gloss, rainbow-colored stuffed animals, and patterned diaries. The teens felt out of place here but window shopped a bit anyway. Bess picked up a ruffled black purse and posed with it in front of a large mirror. What do you think of this, Nancy? Nancy gave the bag a good look, it's simple enough to pair with almost any dress. I do feel like it is a little silly looking though. Bess pouted a little before putting the bag back on the wall display. Nancy circled the aisles, then something caught her eye. It was a large leather-bound locking dairy. It was blue with many intricate gold designs on top. It looked like something one would find in an antique shop and not in a children's store. She turned it over to see the price, resulting in her almost dropping it from sticker shook. It was expensive for a diary. Nancy fought with herself mentally over whether or not to buy the book, as Bess watched amused. Nancy repeatedly kept walking over to the shelf to put down the item only to pick it right back up to examine it once more. You might as well get it or you will be thinking about it all the rest of the day, Bess advised. In response, Nancy weakly nodded her head in agreement. Then walked over to the counter to purchase the diary. The next shop they visited was a large gift shop twice the size of the first one they had visited. It was filled to the brim with beach-themed items. Seashells, wind chimes, water sports gear, and tacky magnets littered the shelves. The girls discovered that towards the back of the store they had a so-called pet area that housed hermit crabs with painted shells. I do not know why anyone would want one of these as a pet, Nancy commented. Yeah, they literally stink. Bess said as she dramatically pinched her nose. Thankfully, the other half of the store was filled with many fashionable bathing suits in various styles. This white bikini with black polka dots is cute. Don't you think Nancy? Bess asked. Yeah, that is cute. Why don't you try it on? That is a good idea, Bess said. Nancy rubbed her temple. I'm gonna head outside to get some fresh air. Bess looked up from the bathing suits she was just looking through, are you okay? Nancy smiled weakly, I have got a headache from the smell of those hermit crabs. It is no big deal. Be careful out there by yourself. I will try not to keep you waiting for too long. Once outside, Nancy sat down on an iron bench and pulled out her new diary. She carefully unlocked the tome, took in the smell of the new paper and began to jot down a few ideas in it. Nancy sat there lost in deep thought for a while before looking up. Was that best she saw slip away down an alley behind the store, she wondered. She quickly packed her stuff back into the shopping bag before getting up to follow after the girl. Bess wait up. I am right here. Nancy cried out. Nancy chased after the girl troughed the back allies, only find herself at a dead end. What the? Where is she? Nancy asked as she took in her surroundings. It was dark, damp, and reeked of dead fish. Suddenly, a cloud of thick smoke appeared, then thinned to reveal the women from the strange gift shop. Nancy took a few steps back and stumbled. Have you uncovered anything new, my pet? asked the woman with a feeble voice. She came closer to Nancy, then in the blink of an eye, she had somehow gotten a hold of the compass. Wait, how did you get that from me? Nancy asked, feeling surprised. You are far more clever than I first thought. Fate has smiled on you by gifting the spinning arrow. The women seemed to study the item for a moment before handing it back to Nancy. So the spinning arrow is the compass? What did the song What Did You Retail to You? asked the women. Just something about following the spinning arrow. That is an interesting development, replied the woman. She took Nancy's hand into hers, then off to the cove you must go to follow it, however, guard it with your life. Her eyes rimmed with worry, revealing a storm of emotion just beneath the surface. 
I fear that if Jasper finds it, all is doomed. Her vengeance would rest at nothing until all is destroyed. Who is Jasper? Nancy asked, however, in the blink of an eye the old hag had disappeared once again. Was she even really here? Chapter 26 Nancy retraced her steps to find herself back outside the gift shop. She was surprised to find that Bess was visible through the store's glass windows. Bess was standing at the countertop chatting with the cashier. A moment later, Bess came out carrying two bags. Sorry to keep you waiting so long. The wait was not too bad. Were you there the whole time? Nancy asked. Bess's face wore a look of confusion, yeah, it is not like I left for pizza. Why would you ask that? Nancy shook her head, I'm sorry I thought I saw a girl that looked like you earlier. It must have been my imagination running wild. Bess's focus changed to the sky as she looked up. It's getting dark. The clouds look like it might rain. Nancy glanced up at the sky, you make a good point. Let's go get something to eat. After walking for a short while they spotted a small coffee shop but before they could make it to the door it started drizzling outside. Come on, we have to make a run for it. Bess urged. They reached the front door just as the drizzle transformed into a downpour of water. Once inside, they found to be very trendy and filled with college kids. For sitting there were small cafe-style tables near the windows and largely comfy sofas in the middle of the room. The girls made their way to one of the sofas before collapsing on top of it. Then they put their bags beside them on the floor. On the coffee table in front of them, they found menus to look through. The cafe offered an assortment of many exotic coffees, teas, and sweets. A moment later, a young waitress appeared at their table, Hello, my name is Emily. I will be your server today. What can I get for you? The peach lemonade sounds really good. I will take that, said Nancy with a smile. Bess took a long time to choose. I want a small mocha with foam and two chilate chip cookies. Very well, I will be right back with your order. While we are waiting, I might as well head to the bathroom, Nancy said as she stood up. All right, have fun, Bess replied with a wink. On her way back from the bathroom, Nancy was lost in thought. Thus resulting in her bumping into someone. I am so sorry. It was all my fault. Nancy drew, what an unexpected surprise, Ryan exclaimed. Nancy blushed as she looked up at him. She was at a loss for words. Is this your first time visiting this cafe? Oh, yes I am here with my friend. You are with a friend? I was going to ask you to sit with me and chat, however, I do not want to butt in. Nancy blinked repeatedly as her thoughts raced. Please, come sit with me. I mean us. Only if I will not be any trouble. You would not be. It is this way. Nancy nervously said as she grabbed his hand to show him to the sofa. Bess was surprised to see Ryan walk up with Nancy. I hope it is all right. I invited him to sit with us. Nancy explained as she took her place on the couch. Ryan sat down beside her. Gotten into any trouble lately? Chase asked. Bess shot Nancy a sly look, not me, however, Nancy is always causing trouble. In response, Nancy did a spit take. Once recovered, she tried to change the subject of the conversation. I'm surprised at how popular this place is. Yeah, it has always been a busy place. Well at least, since I first came here with my brother a few years ago. Ryan explained. Oh wow, you have a brother. Does he live around here? Nancy asked. Ryan closed his eyes and thought, yes, he does still live in town. We have not talked in quite a while. Ever since our mom died, we have not really seen eye to eye on most things. Nancy reached out and rested her hand on his shoulder, I am so sorry. 
Ryan wiped a tear that was running down his face, it is not a big deal anymore. It happened years ago. What have you been up to Ryan? Anything new? Bess asked. Oh, nothing new. I have just been working most of the time. He then looked at his watch then seemed to panic. Please excuse me. I must have lost track of time and am running a little late for work. Good luck at work, Bess said as he got up to run out the front door. Well, that was short, commented Nancy. I hope he gets there safely. I have dibs on his brother if he is even half as cute as Ryan. Bess declared teasingly as she flashed a sky smirk. Shortly after, the girls found themselves hailing a taxi. A kind-looking man in his mid-sixties pulled over to let the girls into his taxicab. Where to miss? Bess turned to Nancy, any ideas of where to visit, or do you want to go back to the inn? Nancy leaned forward, do you offer drive-by tours? Indeed, I do. Any particular place? Nancy pondered for a moment, yes, I want to see the Ocean Cove. Shortly after, they arrived at the cove. Now that there is an old lighthouse that is not in use anymore. It has been neglected for so many years that all that remains is the brickwork of the building, explained the taxi driver. As Nancy listened, she opened up the compass to discover its needle spinning wildly. She murmured under her breath, what in the world? As they drove around to the different areas of the cove the spinning of the compass seemed to slow. The needle came to a halt as it pointed straight ahead. Nancy looked up to find the Isle of Mist in front of her. A chill went down Nancy's spine at the more sight of the place. Oh Lord, not there. Chapter 27 The girls arrived back at the inn shortly after nightfall. Upon entering, the innkeeper gave Nancy a message from a police officer offer asking to be called back. Nancy went into the study to make the phone call. A man who sounded to be in his late fifties answered the phone. This is Captain Spears here. Can I help you? Yes, someone called and left this number to reach you. This is Miss Nancy Drew. Oh yes, Miss Drew. Hold on a moment while I pull out this file. In the background, it sounded like something was knocked over. Damn it! Why did it have to soak my notes? After a few minutes, he continued, the young boy that was caught in your room has woken up. He told us that last night he was approached by a strange man, who offered him a pile of money just to get back a lost hanky. A lost hanky? That is an odd thing to pay someone to retrieve. Indeed, it is a miss. I will let you know if we find out anything else. Thank you for your time. I am glad to know that the kid is all right. Have a good night sir. You too miss. The police officer said before hanging up his phone. Afterward, both girls went up to their room and took turns taking bubble baths. At dinner, the innkeeper told stories of when he had been a sailor many years ago. He claimed to have once seen a beautiful mermaid that was later proven to be a dolphin. While in the middle of telling another story about a drunk seagull, the phone rang. The innkeeper paused his story to answer the call. His face went pale as he listened. Then he turned to Bess and said, you need to take this call. Bess's hands trembled as she took the phone. Hello, this is Bess, she answered. There was a long silence as Bess listened to the caller. How could this happen, she replied as tears came to her eyes. A birth defect? Nancy got up from the table to put a comforting arm around Bess. Do I need to schedule a flight home? asked Bess. Okay, thank you. Tell Dad, I love him. Bess hung up the phone and held her head down low. Bess, what has happened? Nancy asked. It is Uncle, Norman. He had a small heart attack while working on his farm. They said it was caused by a hole in his heart that must have been there since he was born. Is he going to be okay? He will have surgery in a few days to fix it. 
The doctors seem to think of his chances for recovery are good. Bess said as she cried tears. You need to rest, said Nancy. That would help. Are you going to go back home early? My parents are insisting that I finish out the trip. So, I guess not. Bess was so upset that she could not eat the rest of her dinner. So, she went upstairs to bed early. Nancy, on the other hand, found that she could not fall asleep after dinner. She tried to rest but kept tossing and turning for hours. Finally, she got up and grabbed a book, and tiptoed out of the bedroom. Once downstairs, she sat in a worn leather chair with a hardback copy of Journey to the Center of the Earth in her hands. She was soon engrossed in the classic book. Hours later, she looked up from the book, to check the time on the wall clock. Good lord, how can it be two in the morning? Nancy whined. How was she going to get enough sleep to go out exploring in the morning at this rate? While patting the book she said, Sorry professor, your journey will have to wait for another night. Chapter 28 In the morning, the teens traveled to a beach that Ryan had told Nancy about a few days ago. This area was mostly undeveloped except for a few small beach houses. Thankfully it was very quiet here with little to no other people in sight. While Bess laid out on a beach towel attempting to achieve to perfect sexy tan, Nancy explored the area. Nancy felt so here free here like a bird let loose from a gilded cage. The wind played with the ends of her strawberry blonde hair while the sand gently shifted underfoot. All round her seagulls appeared seemingly out of nowhere. Sorry little guys, I did not bring anything to share. With her camera in hand, Nancy made it down to the water's edge. It was still very cold to the touch. Slowly she walked along the coast taking in the sights and sounds. Keeping an ever-watchful eye out for anything interesting washed up on the shimmering sands. Then she spotted a wet pile of sand that was bubbling. What could it be? Perhaps a crab or starfish, she asked. Nancy grabbed a small piece of driftwood to poke at it. When nothing emerged from the sand, she fell to her knees and began the dig through the sand. After a few minutes of searching, all she found was shell fragments. Flustered she let out a sigh. But then she gave the fragments another look through to discover a few shark teeth of different sizes. She continued down the shoreline in search of seashells, until a strange sound caught her off guard. It sounded like a high-pitched noise. What in the world? Nancy questioned as she scanned the area for the source of the sound. Nancy laughed at herself once she noted the pod of small dolphins playing offshore. She pulled out her camera and attempted to take some photos of the animals. Ryan was right this is an amazing place, she commented. Nancy wandered around aimlessly for a while until she found an area full of tide pools. She ventured closer to the side of a large tide pool for a more detailed look. To her surprise, she found that it contained different kinds of starfish and crabs that dominated the area and hunted what they could. Nancy sat down for a rest on the ground as she continued to watch the little world in front of her. A little orange hermit crab emerged from the tide pool. Its shell was covered in flaking gold paint which Nancy assumed meant that it had once been a pet. Someone must have set it free along this beach, she commented. The little crab paid no mind to the giant that rested just a few feet away as it slowly made its way towards a small sand dune. As it traveled, it dragged its oversized shell along with it. That one is way too big for you little guy, Nancy said as he began to look for a more appropriately sized seashell. Nancy could not find one anywhere close by, so she walked over the sand dune to continue her search. Once she was on the other side, however, she found something very interesting. It looked to be an abandoned lighthouse. The lighthouse rested on top of a rocky platform, rusty metal railings and stairs clung to the side of the building. Nancy has overcome with curiosity. So, she walked up to the building and made her way up the rickety metal stairway. Once outside the heavy metal door of the lighthouse, she found that it opened easily. 
strange for an abandoned building. I expected the hinges to be rusted in place. Inside she was greeted by the faint smell of carnosine. The space inside of the lighthouse was filled by a small living room and kitchen that looked bare. Next, she went upstairs and discovered a bedroom. It housed a small bed, a dresser, and a closet. The bed was a mess and the room was full of cobwebs and dust. Nancy looked in the first few drawers of the dresser. It was full of vintage men's clothing. Then she tried the closet to find that it was locked. What is worth locking up in an old forgotten place like this, she asked. With a hairpin, she picked the lock. To her surprise, this door did not lead to a closet, instead it was a doorway to another bedroom. This room looked to be in good shape. A futon was in the corner with messy covers. Beside it was a dresser Nancy found to full be more modern men's clothing. She found a gray shirt with a bird symbol on. Where have I seen that before, she wondered. Nancy locked the door back before making her way to the very top of the building to look at the lighting mechanism. Here she found that the huge light bulb was broken probably by an old baseball bat that lay across the floor. The copper wiring had also been cut out of the mechanism. As Nancy was leaving, she crossed the room on the first floor to notice something she had missed earlier. It appeared to be a door to another room. She opened the door to find a small storage room. In the corner was an old gasoline backup generator. It must have been gasoline that I smelled earlier and not carnosine. I wonder if this thing still works. Nancy looked over the machine until she found a button marked on. Upon pressing it the machine started up resulting in the building's overhead lights came on. So that is how a person is living here, she exclaimed. Then she turned off the machine before leaving the building. Before heading back down the beach, she took one last long look at the rust bucket of a lighthouse. I wonder who has been hiding out in a dump like this, she questioned. Chapter 29 Nancy got from up for her chair outside of a small Hawaiian shaved ice shop. The sweet rainbow-colored treat had started to drip all over her hands in the summer heat. Nancy went over to ask someone for some napkins at the register before looking around. Her legs felt so heavy and stiff from all the walking she had done along the coastline. Nancy regretted all the walking she had done along the shoreline as she explored. I cannot just wait around here all day. I have the stuff to get done and soon it will be dark, she said out loud. The atmosphere around her had already started to shift from a friendly family hangout toward a college-geared party. Young college kids seemed to appear out of nowhere. A guy was playful chasing after girls trying to steal kisses while punks on skateboards were riding through trying to knock people off their feet. I so do not belong here, Nancy muttered and she hung her head down low trying to go unnoticed. Hey babe, said a young male voice nearby. Nancy paid it no mind. Hey, babe I love you, marry me, said a young man that was now standing in front of her. Get lost I am not interested. Nancy barked feeling pissed off. He took a few steps back and held his hand up in defeat. Chill girl, I just think you are hot, he said before walking off. Not long after a buff guy came walking out from behind the building with another much skinner guy. The buff guy pointed to the other and announced, he whizzed back their girls. Want to go see? In response, Nancy rolled her eyes. Nancy had had enough by this point, so she entered a surf shop to escape the growing crowds. She looked around finding that this store did not offer much of a selection and what did they have been way overpriced. Then she heard Bess's voice from outside, Nancy drew. Nancy drew you. Bess, where have you been? Nancy asked as while running up to her friend. Out looking for you with Chase. You went off exploring hours ago and never came back. Bess, I am sorry. I lost track of time. As long as you are okay, what is done is done. Come on let's get away from all these wolves. Bess said as she led the way to where Chase was waiting in his car. So where to? 
The beach or perhaps a movie? Chase asked with a sly smile. We need to get to the hidden mermaid isle, said Nancy. Why do you want to go to a dangerous place like that, asked Chase. I am sure you would not believe me even if I told you, Nancy replied. Go ahead and try to explain. Chase insisted. Well, you know that old watch I found? It's kind of led me to find a compass. The crazy part is that the needle spins. All compass needles spin Nancy, he added with a smirk. Bess moved closer and took the compass from Nancy. No, it is not like that, she held it open to devastating. Once again, the needle spun around on its own accord. Nancy thinks it is leading us somewhere. And we tracked it down to that island. I will take you both there, however, I do not think we will find anything there but old myths. Like the one about of the frozen fog. Frozen fog. That is new to me. Nancy added in. Just some old wives' tale from who knows how long ago. It is said if you're wonder too deep in the fog on a cold night you become engulfed by it and become frozen solid. Trapped in a layer of frost forever destined never to felt warmth ever again. Bess quickly turned around to face Nancy. Do we really need to go? Trust me we will all be just fine, said Nancy. Once on the boat, Chase must drive much slower than usual because the area surrounding the isle was covered in a dense fog. The area is also known to sink and trap many watercrafts with hidden rocks and sandbars. Do not be worried it is just a trick of the mist. It will take a while to get to the beach, which is the only area we can dock. Why is that? asked Bess. Most of the isle is made up of rocky shores. Because of this, only small rowboats can land on the other parts of the isle. Chase explained. The tide seems high tonight. I wonder if it will hinder us in any way, commented Nancy. Something is not right here, Chase said as they neared the beach landing. What is it? Nancy questioned. See that area in the middle on the beach? It looks as if the mist is originating from that one small spot. We needed to get a better look, added Nancy. Just then a strange purple glowing orb appeared in the mists. What is that? Bess asked while she wrapped her arms around Chase. Over there on the right, is that rowboats pulled up on shore? Nancy questioned. Yeah, it sure looks like it. Is that a large wooden tub underneath the thickest part of the fog? Bess spoke up. I see someone. Get down low and be quiet, advised Chase. Bess painted out. All then sat low in the boat and kept quiet to go unnoticed. A man was abbreviates carrying what looked like a ladder cage wrapped up in sackcloth. A man came into view, as the fog thinned. He was walking along the sandy shore, carrying in his arms what looked to be a block-shaped item covered in sackcloth. He looked to be in his forties, was thin as a rail, and wore a basic flannel shirt paired with faded blue jeans. Keep the mist going, Harold. Feed the hounds, Harold. Buy the food, Harold. All they ever do is boss me around. Mumbled the man. As he neared the wooden tub, he threw the bag down on the ground with force. What could it be? Is he trying to break it? Bess asked. Look at the thick gloves he is wearing. Chase pointed out. As they continued to watch, the man fell to his knees before pulling from the bag that looked like white bricks. He then tossed it into the tub, instantly creating another fog cloud. That must be dry ice. A lot of people use that trick to create foggy scenes when filming movies. Nancy explained. Why would someone go through so much trouble? Are they trying to hide something? Bess asked. I have no idea what they are up to but think that we need to get a better look at that aisle. Nancy answered. Well, it looks like we are out of luck. The only way we can get onto the aisle is by that beach. If those people really are hiding something, they will not be happy when we just show up out of the blue. 
Chase explained. Not necessary, there might be another way onto the isle. In the mermaid's legend, there is a cave that was used to come and go from the isle. I wonder if that cave might actually exist. Chase took a moment to process this new information, you might be right. There is underwater cave near one of the cliffs facing. I just never linked it to the legend before. Good thing I brought along out diving gear just in case. We did not bring our swimming suits, Bess whined. We will be fine with what we have on just this once. Nancy commented. Soon after all three teens were in the water. Chase led the way, however, it took them quite a while to find the cave entrance in the dark. Once inside the cave's entrance, Chase handed them each glow sticks. These are so we can stay together and not get lost. It did not take long for them to find the surface of the water. They were surprised to see the moon high overhead though at the large hole in the ceiling of the cave. This is a moon pool. I have heard many ancient legends about them. Nancy explained. Come on girls, we have to claim the vines to get out, Chase said as he pointed to the greenery. Do we have to? Bess asked not willing to take a chance on falling. Do not be such a chicken come on. Chase egged her. Bess was about to start claiming when she saw something strange in the moonlight water. A dark shadow swirled around under the surface of the water. Bess caught a quick glance at the creature's tail. It white with an iridescent sheen that reminded her of an opal gemstone. A fish? No far too big. Bess commented a chill went up to her spine. She hurried to catch up to the others. They had left their diving stuff in the cave for now. Right now, the teens had more to worry about than stuff. Chapter 30 The isle appeared deserted until the teens noticed the sound of digging. That was followed by shouting like two men fighting off in the distance. I want to go see what is happening, however, I think that we need to keep a safe distance from whatever trouble there is, explained Chase. He kept the boat close to the mangrove trees that grew along the shoreline as they moved closer. It was not long before two men in question came into view. The teens watched the men as they buried something in the ground. The two men were talking loudly, I could really go for some nice cold beer right about now, said a short, chubby, bald man. The other man had a skinny build with dark features. He replied, Earl, we have to get this buried. The boss does want not the police to find this stuff. I ask you this question, Jack. What is the point of us coming to the haunted island to scare people off, if we still have to bury the ammo? Earl asked. The boss has his reasons, you idiot. I see you are full of yourself today. The two men continued arguing with each other once again while causing like sailors. After a short while, they walked off shouting that they needed, more ale. The teens took this chance to dash over to the crates. They were shocked to find something unexpected inside. This is mustard gas. This has been banned since War World II. Nancy exclaimed. Chase did not respond instead he flashed Nancy a worried look. Bess nibbled on her nails, due to the stress. The teen's eyes grew wide from horror when they heard a voice from behind them say. What look at what we got here. It was Jack, who now had a handgun pointed at them. I see that your lot are just a bunch of stupid noisy teenagers. He walked closer to the teens before roaring, SIT down by the fallen tree. The teens moved as directed. As she sat on the ground, Bess reached out to hold Chase's hand for comfort. I am sick of dealing with snot-nosed brats like you. Jack complained as his face turned beet red. Then he threw some rope at Chase's feet. You there, tie the girls up. Chase gritted his teeth, no, I cannot do that. Listen here, boy. If you do not do as told, I will blow their pretty little brains out, he yelled while pointing the gun at the girls. Chase cringed as he bent over to seize the rope before making his way over to Bess to restrain her. 
Bess whimpered as Chase pulled the rope tight around her wrists and tied them together. When it was Nancy's turn to be tied up, he whispered, I am so sorry. I hate to have to do this. In response, Nancy motioned for him to be silent and listen. Earl, I need you to stand guard. I am going to take a leak. Jack muttered as he handed Earl the gun, before turning to walk off into the woods to relieve himself. Earl held the gun down at his side. What a lot I choose to work with. He looked off in the distance, before adding, that's nothing another ale won't fix. By now Chase had moved on binding Nancy's ankles. She leaned forward to whisper, now is your chance to attack. He stole a quick glance behind him at the man who was now downing another drink. In the blink of an eye, Chase had dashed after Earl, perfectly tackling him to the ground. Earl was taken by surprise, then had the breath knocked out of him. He laid there in the dirt while gasping for air. Chase grabbed what was left of the rope to use as a weapon. He got behind Earl while wrapping the rope around the man's neck. They rolled in the dust together as both men fought for their life. Chase, get the gun, yelled Bess as she watched through tear-rimmed eyes. Chase kept his grip tight as he witnessed the man start to black out. Just then a gunshot rang out, causing a loud echo. Chase rose to his feet to see Jack standing there. What was it Ma always used to say, he asked while pointing the gun at Chase. Now I remember. If you want something done right, do it yourself. He pulled back the hammer on the gun as he laughed like a madman. Now who should I kill first? The fiery redhead, wimpy blonde, or the beach bum? After a short pause, Jack aimed the gun at Bess. By doll face, he said while pulling the trigger. There was a long bang as the gun was fired. When the bullet hit its mark, Bess cried out in pain. Chase blinded by rage, lunged forward to land a clean hit on Jack's jaw. The gun flew from Jack's hand as his body twisted in the direction of the blow. As if instinctual, Jack countered with a stomach punch. How dare you strike my handsome face! You will pay for this boy! The two men continued to exchange blows until Chase was knocked backward into the ocean water. While he struggled to get to his feet, Jack pulled a long switchblade from his pants pocket. Once Chase was within arm's length, he grabbed the team. Just then a loud, whack, was heard as Jack fell into the waves. When Chase looked up to see Ryan's face he saw brimming with tears. A large tree branch that was broken in half bobbed in the water by her side. Save the drama for later big brother. We need to leave before anyone else shows up. Ryan exclaimed. Chase nodded in agreement. They made their way back to Bess, to find her clutching her shoulder. Nancy bent down next to Bess. Please let me take a look. After inspecting the wound, Nancy let out a sigh of relief, you are lucky. It just grazed your skin. There is not even much blood. We need to get back to the boat as soon as possible. I have a knife we can use to free Bess from these ropes on there. Chase said as he lifted Bess up off the ground. Then he turned to Nancy, now that I come to think of it how did you get your feet free from the restraints? Nancy grinned like a naughty child, oh that, I used a piece of a broken bottle that was nearby. Chapter 31 after making it back to the boat and freeing Bess from the rope that was tied around her wrists and ankles, the teens found themselves in another tense situation. Ryan, why did you disappear and where have you been? Chase asked as he held his brother by the shirt collar. Not that it is any of your business but I left because of all the bull crap at home. Ryan yelled as he pushed Chase off of him. Chase puffed his chest out, do you even care how you have made the family feel? We thought you might be dead. Ryan's eyes filled with rage, family. What family? After mom died our family fell apart at the seams. You still have dad and me, Chase replied. Is that a joke? Dad is a broken man that spends most of the time drinking. 
Then there is you, the golden boy, dad's favorite. In his eyes, I will never compare to you. Ryan argued. Chase shook his head in denial, what do you mean by that? I am no golden boy. Ryan looked up at his brother, you just do not understand. Father tries to put on a happy face at work but behind closed doors he is abusive. He would constantly put me down and compare me to you. On this worst days, he would even beat the crap out of me. Chase looked to be in shock, I had no idea. Ryan sat down, I stayed at home to try to finish high school. Thinking that was what mom would have wanted so. Until one night, when dad got so messed up that he pulled a knife on me. Chase's face paled, father did what to you? Ryan looked away, he was pissed off one night and threatened me with a kitchen knife. Chase hung his head low, I am so sorry. I had no idea. Ryan sighed, the drama is all over with now. I left home to discover that I do all right on my own. Chase made eye contact with his brother, where have you been living? Ryan chuckled, I have been staying with one of my old buddies, however, his girlfriend lives out of town. She likes comes to visit on the weekends. Unfortunately, she does not seem to like me very much. So on the weekends, I stay in this little place I am working on fixing up. I am quite proud of it, I recently got a power generator in there. It is starting to look nice. Upon hearing Ryan's words something clicked in Nancy's mind, is he the one that was staying at the lighthouse, she wondered but did not dare ask the question aloud. If it was true, she felt that this was not the right time or place to ask. Chase gave his brother an odd look, well, I am glad you have been doing all right. Ryan looked to his brother but did not add anything to the conversation. Nancy cleared her throat, Ryan, why were you on the island? It is supposed to be deserted. Ryan was surprised, I used to travel to this island quite often on my small rowboat. I enjoy sketching the scenery and wildlife. Well, I did until, about a year ago when these crooks started showing up. What did you do then? asked Nancy. I went to the police about it. Originally they did not believe me until I started collecting evidence. Then they offered me a job. For the past few months, they have been paying me to keep an eye on this place. Chase spoke up, I never would have expected that. I believe it best if we get a move on. Before someone else finds us, suggested Ryan. Chase sat in the driver's seat as he tried to start the boat. In response, it made a stage sound and its lights flashed. I cannot get the engine to turn over. The battery must be dead. Bess started to panic, we are going to die here. Chase got up from his seat to wrap his arms around Bess. Nancy stepped forward, Ryan, did you say you have a rowboat? Ryan smiled awkwardly, not anymore, I upgraded to a small motorboat. Unfortunately, I have it tied up in a secluded spot on the other side of the aisle. Do you think we can get there safety? Bess asked. Ryan frowned, it will be difficult since those goons will be after us soon, but it is our only option. I need to fill you in on something. Nancy said as she pulled out the compass to show Ryan. After explaining the strange happenings to Ryan, he replied, I do not believe in the supernatural side of things, however, I promise to help you figure this all out. Then the teens set out for the other side of the island, which just so happened to be in the same direction as the compass was pointing in. Chapter 32 As the teens continued their journey, the compass's needle steered them in a northward direction. Do you think we can investigate? Nancy asked the group. Chase plopped down on the ground, we all need a short rest, however, if you want to go take a quick look around, I do not see any harm in it. Mind if I go along to keep you company? asked Ryan. Please do come along, I will enjoy the company, she replied. The two teens followed the compass's arrow for about half of a mile. It led them to an oak tree. I do not see how it can be pointing to this tree. What we are looking for should be hundreds of years old. Ryan explained. 
what if it is under this tree? Nancy replied as she got down on her knees to search along the ground. A few minutes later, she cried out, ouch, something cut me. Upon closer inspection, the item looked to be a piece of metal. She dug around it to unearth an rusted knife that was resting on a large flat stone. Carved into the stone was the words, deep within the darkness it shall be safe. What does that mean? Asked Ryan. What kind of places do you automatically think of as dark? The deep ocean or a cave? He answered. How many caves are on the island? Nancy asked. Ryan looked lost in thought for a moment, there are two. One that connects to the ocean. The other I have never explored, he explained. I believe, we got onto the island through the first cave. Where is the second located? The entrance is hidden in some rocky cliffs near where the criminal's headquarters are. I think we should go explore the cave. Nancy said while wearing a look of deterioration. Ryan took a step back in shock, that is a terrible idea. We are in danger here and going down into a cave is even more dangerous. Do not worry. I'm not planning on claiming down into a deep dark cave. That is what cave exploring is. You have to go with cave equipment and a team of people. Nancy rolled her eyes, I won't be doing any of that. I just want to take a look. In all honesty, that could prove to be a great place to hide out if need be. Why do I get the feeling you are going to do this no matter what I say, he asked. Nancy just smiled in response. Fine, I will help. Ryan said as he threw his hands up in frustration. They carefully retraced their steps to rejoin their friends. They found Bess and Chase leaning up against a tree fast asleep. A short nap sounds like a good idea. Chase suggested. Nancy agreed, and the two teens chose to rest up against an old willow tree that was just a few feet away from their friends. A few hours later, the teens were startled awake when an eerie call rang out through the night. Chase what do you think that was? Bess asked. He turned to face Bess before saying, how am I supposed to know? Sounded like a wolf call. Most likely from across the cove. Ryan added. Bess sighed, well, I am not going to be falling about asleep any time soon after hearing whatever it was. Agreed, we should working on getting back to the mainland, said Chase. Thankfully, this time Ryan led them to a new trail beside the river. He was hoping the sound of the running water would help hide their presence. As they walked, the moonlight light their way, at the same time casting strange shadows in the background. They traveled on foot for a few miles until, they could hear the sounds of men talking in this distance. I want to take a look and see what we are up against, said Ryan. To his surprise, Nancy insisted on coming along on the scouting mission. It would have been safer to wait with the others. I can do for myself. Ryan explained as they traveled. Do not give me that line. I am tougher than I look, she replied. Soon the two teens found themselves hiding behind a few bushes as they watched the men in front of them. They must be having another meeting with the boss man. Ryan said under his breath. That is his tent over there, he said then pointed at a deep red large tent that was set up in the middle of a small clearing. I wonder what this meeting is about. I have no idea. Perhaps, it has something to do with the boss's newest obsession. I have overheard the man talking about his search for with some kind of ancient missing treasure. Ryan replied. That is interesting information. What is that? He asked while pointing to the an old storage building that looked like it was about to collapse. Its front door had been open, which allowed the wooden crates inside to be seen. Nancy stained her eyes for a better look, I think it is fireworks. Why would they have fireworks? If I had to guess, they might be counting on the sounds from them sounding like bombs or explosives. They have that fake ghost set up near shore, maybe this is part of their plan to keep locals away. 
Ryan was lost in thought for a moment before adding, follow me I may have an idea. Nancy grinned mischievously at Ryan, as she imagined the kind of trouble he had planned. Chapter 34 Not long after the two had made their way back to their friends with arms full of fireworks. I can't believe how easy it was to take these. Ryan remarked to Nancy. Now to think all we had to do is move one small radio and turn on a baseball game. Sometimes life is just too easy. Nancy said. The teens made their way back into the woods in pairs. Ryan and Nancy went east and the others south. With great care they peeled the fireworks up and rigged a lighting device using some firewood and and a long wick. Chase and Bess went back just outside of the hideout to wait. At exactly ten o'clock both teen lit the rigged kindling and raced back to their friends making sure to not go in a straight line to keep from meeting up with the criminals when they came to investigate the noise. Once Nancy was halfway back she heard the first batch of fireworks go off then the others. It sounded like a war zone. Not long after she heard some men coming her way and hid behind some nearby pine trees. Their plan had worked. She raced the rest of the way eager to meet back up with her friends. Once there something did not feel right. She hid once more trying to figure out what. Just then some men came through carrying her friends who were passed out. Oh no what have they done? She followed behind trying to stay out of sight. They were brought just outside a large dark gray tent. Chase seemed to be waking up a little when a tall man stepped out of the tent. A look of deep surprise was on the man's face to see them there. Nancy was in shock as well to see the very professor she had shown the watch to just a few days before. Boss we caught them what do you want us to do now, asked a small man. I know these three. Was there another a young titan-haired girl perhaps, asked the professor. No boss we caught them all. Said the other man who seemed quite proud of himself. Search the whole I'll just to be sure we cannot risk anyone escaping and leading the police back here. We have too much riding on this new deal that is happening tomorrow night. He seemed to notice something and moved closer to her. Nancy held her breath scared. Before the man could reach her a large grey hound came running out of the tent and right up to her. It grabbed hold of her shirt and pulled her out into the open. To see what they were up to. Once near the camp she could hear a loud commotion. Get all those explosives out of the open. They will be ruined in the heavy rain. Yelled one man from across the camp. I do not care what the men think. We will lose a gold mine if this is not done right. Where are Amy's and Ben's crews? We need every man here. Yelled the professor from the large army tent. This was good for the teens perhaps in the confusing they could slip back into the moon pool and get to their own boat before the seas got too rough. Like a ninja Nancy slipped away from the camp to get back to her friends. Once back at the secret cave entrance Nancy found her friends waiting. The moon pool is off limits. Chase spit out angrily. What? Why can we not go there? Nancy asked confused as she went to stand beside Ryan. The way is blocked there is a small fire that way. Most likely from a stray light bolt. Chase explained with a huff. The only other way I know to get there is right by another camp that is full at the moment. Ryan added quietly. Maybe with this storm we can slip by in the confusion. Nancy suggested trying to be optimistic. These are a pretty brave lot I am afraid we would have to wait until the storm got really bad to slip by them. By that time however, the seas would be too wild to get back to our ship by swimming. So our only chance is the misty cove. We will need to hurry. As Nancy said this another crack of thunder sounded and made them shiver. They traveled at a quick pace and made it back sut as Tae Su was coming up. Once they got there something felt strange to Nancy. Where are to dry ice and fake ghost guys? She asked her friends not sure what they should do now. The sea was starting to get rough with the wind they could not wait around much longer. 
They ran up to a speedboat and tried to start it. Of course there were no keys. Nancy untried the boat as Ryan tired to hot-wire it. Can you do a chase? Bess asked afraid. Not sure I have only ever hot-wired by Dad's old jeep once before. Hopefully it is too different. Just then they heard something stirring in the back of the boat to their surprise a drunken man sat up from under a tarp and pointed at them. What? Who are you? He asked while badly slurring. He gave them a hard look then dived for a silver button. Their eyes were wide in shock. Chase tried to dive for the man but it was too late, the man hit the switch and a ear-piecing alarm sounded. The teen instantly covered their ears to mask the horrible sound. Chase motioned for them to run away the teens tried by was caught again by a different band of criminals. Good job brother leaving that drunk behind. We were merely trigged to ditch him but this worked out much better. Said a young woman who stepped out of the shadows she wore a dark outfit of gray and purple and her long black hair blew around in the wind. From somewhere else a man appeared he looked to be around her same age but taller with jet black hair and a charcoal outfit on. Yes I agree Amy the boss will be pleased with us. Good thing we followed our hunch. There was just no way the world famous Nancy Drew could be so easily caught in the first place. Now what shall we do with them? He said with a creepy expression on his face. Amy walked along beside her brother then paused in tough for a brief moment. The boss would want them brought back alive but I think it would be best to kill them here but how is the question? She cooed like a mincing evil crow. While there stood there arguing on the best method to kill the teen's chase made a brag for it. In the commotion Nancy also got loose she watched as he ran for the water. Once up to his neck in the water he felt something strange happen a pulse ran through the water like he had never felt before it did this continuously. It must be the treasure had had secrets stuffed in T.I. equals O his pocket that was causing this. Chase was not sure what to do the man came into the water after him. Meanwhile back on shore a man was taking aim to kill Chase with a shotgun. Nancy saw this and raced over to fight him for the gun. Chapter 35 Chase kept swimming up until he felt the pulsing stop. A chill ran down his spine something powerful was about to happen. A huge wave came out of the sea as if summoned and pulled him back closer to shore. Now instead of running about he headed for his friends. They watched a mysterious dark shadow like the one that had first saw in the moon pool appeared and swam aground the men still in the water. Just like a shark it seemed to be following them. Them one by one they were dragged down under the dark water. They men fraught to no avail. All the others stared to run for their lives but Nancy looked out upon the waters. For just a spit second Nancy thought she saw a blonde haired woman staring back at her with glowing eyes and long sharp teeth. Then she was gone. Nancy ran and quickly caught up to her friends and urged them to go faster. Guys there is not a mermaid that guards this isle it is a siren instead. She called out as they ran. Just when Bess turned to ask what the difference was a unearthly loud cry came out the a breath taking alluring song. All the men stopped dead in their tracks then turned to head for the water. Best stop Chase if they get in the water she will kill them. Nancy yelled out on top of the the storm just kept getting stronger by the minute. Nancy intact Ryan it was no easy to hold him down but she manged. Bess grabbed Chase but could slow him down. Down in the water men were once again disappearing out of sight. The girls watched as they vanished under the mighty waves. They could barely stand to watch finally Bess had to turn away. Nancy why is she doing this? She cried out desperate for help. Nancy had to think what could anger a siren. Her mind went back to the story the old women had told her before. About how the creature had summoned up a powerful storm to kill her pirate love who had betrayed her. Then it dawned on her the siren was not really the isle's protector because if she was the men would have all be killed off this alone before now. That was it her treasure. 
but how could that be it was still in the cave? Just then her eyes shot over to Chase and gave him such a hateful look she had guessed what had happened. Best check his pockets. Do not stop to ask questions just do it. Nancy ordered trying to save her friends. By now most of the men had been killed and Chase was getting way to close to the water. In his right pocket Bess pulled out a long string of pearls and a few coins. The the pocket yielded a gold ring and a huge ruby brooch. That was it Nancy knew what she had to do to save them all. Without a second thought she ditched Ryan to run over and snatch the treasure from Bess. Then Nancy turned and headed right for the water as fast as possible. Once was deep she threw out to see the items. There I return them now please spare my friends. Nancy called out in desperation. Rye then the singing stopped but the storm kept growing. The men that were free from the spell ran for their lives. Nancy dragged Chase and Ryan back onto the same boat as before. Hurry Ryan we don't have much time. She ordered eager to get away from this place. Without any questions Ryan went to work hot wiring the engine. Nancy had Chase to help her untie all the boats so that no one but them could escape this isle. As they were doing this the mist started to grow thicker. They barely made it to the just before Ryan got it going. At the top speed the bothers lead them through the fog and out to open waters. Did the siren follow us? Bess asked as she sat exhausted on the boat. Both Ryan and Nancy turned to Chase. Did you take anything else? They fussed. Chase promised he had not and that he would never go after that treasure again. We barely escaped with our lives. Nancy turned to the others. We must never tell anyone else of the treasure or the sirens or many more lives will be lost. She made them all promise before they reached the dock. Tired and exhausted them made it the dock. It seemed like ages had passed since they had been back on the mainland. The teens dragged their feet back to the jeep that was as far as they went before they passed out from exhausted. Hours later they made it to the police station where they got strange looks until Ryan showed them his photos. Once at the aisle they found the professor and what was left of his men all huddled around a fire trying to keep warm. The whole camp had been ruined in the storm. They used a metal detector to find all the bed items. Nothing was saw again of the mermaid either. Ryan was reunited with his family and they had girls over for a huge diner. They spent the day of their vacation all at the beach having a blast. Ryan finally got up the courage to tell Nancy how he felt about her. He was sad to hear about Ned but did not seem to heartbroken. Nancy and Bess left the next day after saying their goodbyes. Chase and Bess exchanged numbers to keep in touch. The boys promised to visit us one day in the States. Nancy gave Ryan a quick peck on the cheek as a than you for all he had done for her. It was so cute to watch him turn beet red. As they were about to take off on the place Nancy glanced the old women from the gift shop standing in the distance she held the watch and compass in her hand. Nancy checked her bag for the compass but it was gone. How did she get it? Nancy glanced up at the women once more this time she grinned and her teeth looked just like the sirens. Her eyes went wide in shock as the the plane pulled away. The End